Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 338 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Howdy, gang. We're coming to you from the Marriott at North Station in Boston for the last time. We're going to be closing the season on Boston. It's not the last time we're going to be together, but it's the last time we'll be together in this city. Bruins are all done, but let's say hi to the boys. How are we feeling busy after a week in Bean Town? I feel great. What a great uh, great time. It's unfortunate it's going to come to an end here with uh, the bees getting beat out. Smell I was you hoping, later, Boston. I was hoping one more live stream. I actually didn't get a chance to get over to Borelli's. I was going to go for Game 7, but... Uh, Wow, what a closeout, and, and what a job by that fan base uh, serenading us for that whole third period. Congratulations to the Islanders. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. The Wit Dog, how you, how how you been enjoying? I know you haven't stayed here all week, but having the boys in. Oh, I love having you guys here. It's very nice. We got to do the live streams we talked about. I didn't get to Long Island either. Oh, shucks. And I, <laughs> I more than anything, I'm very happy for Islanders fans. I'll, 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 I'll go into that in a little bit, but Bruins, see you later. Winnipeg, see you later. Carolina, see you later. We got three of the four finals set, and tonight, tonight's game could mean the final four is ready to roll. Yeah, absolutely. Semifinals are going to be starting this weekend at some point, so be sure to hit, hit up your local package store to load up on the old Pink Whitney Mick, Mickey's, the 375-milliliter bottle. Whether you're celebrating your team moving on or you got to drown your sorrows after another tough year, grab some Pink Whitney Mickey's. All right, and of course, G isn't with us right now. He's here in spirit and on camera. What's up, buddy? How you feeling? You were at the game six last night. Yeah, what's going on, guys? Uh, tough, tough loss last night. The second you heard the Coliseum singing the national anthem, as loud as they were, it was like, oh, we're fucked. Game over. So, tough loss. Islanders fans, super respectable. Shout out to everyone at Borelli's. Shout out to everyone at Hurricanes. The past two weeks have been amazing. Dream come true for me to stream these games, but... I'll, I'll kick it over to you It was guys. like lacrosse pl- practice. He, like, refused to clap. <laughs> it's like the, the, he they, thought they, that would they, be the move. They, they, they sang the anthem, so he walked out and gave up, just like <laughs> just in straight G fashion. Basically, Wait, yeah. hey, Oh, actually, before we move on, you just did the Pink Whitney ad. I saw a video, and I know, listen, you've been on an insane tear. You've been getting minimal sleep, and then I think an Islanders fan handed you a bottle of Pink Whitney, and you took the shot, and a little bit came out at the end. So that was another tough look before the puck <laughs> dropped. I don't think it was too tough of a look. I, I mean, he's fount, fountaining the the pink Whitney in my mouth. He poured so much in there, okay. and then when I closed my mouth, some fell out. Okay, I hadn't drank yet. All right, I was dead sober. I was trying to stay sober for yesterday's game. All right, blame the poor. Uh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> quite a few pink Whitney's going down, especially last night. The Isles won six to two, game six. They take the series. They're going to play Tampa in the semis. Uh, I was down. I know, Biz, you want to go back to game five. We want to get to the Barry Trotz comments that mental warfare, mental warfare. But yeah, uh, I was down there for Ellie's as well with G. I want to thank Mr. Brelli and the Brellies. Dude, that place is huge. Like I walked in, you know, it's a little you think it's a little family restaurant. Place is giant. I had to run in the kitchen to use the bathroom there. Fucking huge, absolutely giant restaurant. And there was a line four hours before the game there just to, to get in. And like G said, the fans were wicked nice. I mean, you know, every city has their reputation. You're getting a cat called a little, but they really were. They were really very nice to us. So we want to we thank them as well. But going back to Barry Trotz, like you said, G, uh, Biz, the mental warfare. He called Bertrand a cheater. He said he's a veteran guy who knows how to cheat on the faceoffs. I'm relying on a very capable officiating crew and linesman to make sure that the cheating doesn't go on. Bergeron then called basically Trotz was a veteran play. He said it's a veteran play by Trotz as a coach to try and get the linesman in officiating to think about it. And then in the game, Bergeron gets checked out of the circle three times. Just the, a the veteran first. off. It was just a veteran off. <laughs> That's what it was. It was a veteran center versus a veteran coach, and they just love telling each Sounds other. Sounds like a Russian veteran. prospect. <laughs> Veteran off. Veteran off. He's actually going by. But he's got a big Owen drink. Powers. He's got a big drinking problem. <laughs> um, Fucking veteran off. So uh, there was more mental warfare before that game, was there not? With with uh, then Cassidy chimed in about the whole. Or no, that, well, that was, was after, that was after game. the game. Okay, that yeah. was post game. All right. Well, let's get to that game just a little bit. Then. Yeah, and ironically, Bergeron was only forty five point seven. If in the series at the dot going into the game, so he wasn't even winning a shitload of faceoffs. But either way, the Isles won that one five to four to take the three two lead. Uh, let's see here. Well, I mean, there's there's a couple notes to that game that were very important. And the fact that we've been hearing that Tuka Rask was nowhere near healthy before that game, and l- maybe even leading into the series, right? Yeah, he was. He had a, his back injury flared up back in March. That's why Swayman had to come in and basically keep the season afloat when, when he did. Then you get into the question, like, 
the guy wants to play, which you got to respect. It's the playoffs. You you know the history of like the Bruins in terms of Bergeron playing through the punctured lung and guys doing anything they can to stay in the lineup and play. And Tuca did it. But are you then risking like the team's success? Are you not healthy enough to do your job? And he didn't look like himself the last few games of that series. I mean, he wasn't moving well. He wasn't able to do what he'd done prior. And I think that more than anything, once you heard after that it's possible he may need surgery, it's like... I thought Swayman would start game six. I really did. And then I thought he was going to start game five based on what I'd heard and what I'd seen. And they ended up throwing him in, in the third period, which I was talking to your old man last night, by the way, Dan, oh, great guy. Oh, yeah, we had a blast. Ab- absolute character. He said that what Swayman let, let in one goal on, on four shots, what it was, and that ended up, sure enough, being the game winner. But you got to think if he starts that game uh, – we we gotta we gotta talk about the discipline too. Boston not necessarily the most disciplined team in that game. We thought one of the penalties was a little bit che- cheesy. On was it the Corrali the, slash? Yeah, the Corrali Corrali slash. Yeah, they were already up uh, one nothing. Then of course Richie elbowed Mayfield. You know, th- so we don't know if it was a makeup call. I know you mentioned it might have been a makeup call. Corrali would. I mean, chintzy ass call. Island does end up scoring. It's one one going into the uh, second period. Also, too, you got to mention the Marshawn layup. I mean, that's a tough play to make, but if he puts that home, it's up two nothing. And then the Basel, I mean, the uh, Corelli call probably doesn't even happen. But they ended point. up scoring. Islanders end up scoring three power play goals in that game. Like you said, Tuca didn't look like himself. He couldn't get that save when he needed to. They switch it up in the third period and go to Swayman, and then you know they they make that surge late. And then end up coming pretty close, making it an entertaining game. But then, then the real fun begins, the post game with Cassidy. I'll say this, that you can talk about the refereeing and Bruins fans, very whiny. I don't think it was great. And I think in the third period, they missed a call on Grizzlick. They missed another call. And maybe, maybe in the end, as a Bruins fan or Cassidy, you look and say, I thought the refs really leaned towards the Islanders in game five. Fuck, guys! Your penalty kill is horrible. Yeah, it, it's yeah. like what? Yeah, you, you, maybe you, maybe you didn't agree with some of the calls. You got to kill the penalties. They were brutal, and the Islanders' power play isn't like the best power play in the league, and they just worked them. And that's why we are talking about the rest with the Islanders, dude. Just alligator blood. This team. R.A. said when I I always chirped down as I said, do you really think they could win the Stanley Cup? It was like January or whatever. You're like, yeah, I do. And you're seeing now why this team, they don't go away. They got great goaltending and their special teams are picking it up. But as a Bruins fan, whine about the officiating. I did agree with you in game five, but you got to kill penalties at this time of year. And your power play has got to be good. And so when you want to whine and complain and talk, it's like, that's what happens. There's going to be games when you get calls, and they ended up switching, switching the officiating crew, right, for game six? Yeah, but then Wyshynski said that was part of the routine anyway. Okay, like, it, so. was like, it was played as, as if it was a reaction to everything. It's like, no, this is kind of how it always goes anyways. Yeah, so that game, I mean, to come back the way they did and give themselves a chance, you wonder if Swayman had started, would it have been a, a, a completely different outcome? But it wasn't. But then you get to game six, and that's when it's like, I know Tuca wants to play, but he's obviously not himself. Throw in Swayman. Change something up. Well, what you said, R.A., was if you if he wasn't necessarily healthy enough to finish the game in Game 5, how much healthier is he going to be 48 hours later to start Game 6, do-or-die situation? and In a crazy barn. In, a, in an insane atmosphere. Now, let, let, let's talk about the post-game comments. And you talked about the officiating crew. A uh, bit of a tidbit here. I guess the, the official in Game 5 who uh, who Cassidy went after was the same guy that Brenda Moore went after and got chinged for 20, 25 grand as well. So that guy's and got 50K under his belt? Yeah. <laughs> he Couple should get pelt. the 50K. I thought, I thought he originally got fined for that terrible pinstripe suit he, suit he was wearing. Did you see that thing? <laughs> That thing was a nightmare on Elm Street. But he ends up getting dinged. He even said afterward he, he didn't think that his comments warranted the 25K fine, but it was a blatant call out of the officials. Yeah, he said if they, they usually if you keep it civil, they don't fine. He goes, I thought I kept it civil. They didn't. You know, he said uh, it's a very – talking about the Islanders. It was, it's very well, well-respected well management and coaching staff over there, but they set up a narrative over there. It's more like the New York Saints instead of the New York Islanders, and obviously everyone went off running with that. But, yeah, he's basically saying that the, the refs did what – Trots one of them too, and that's that's why he got fined. He didn't come out and s- deliberately say it, but he implied it. I, I want to say this: when he said um, they they might actually be the New York Saints, I think it's top three nerdiest lines in the history of a post game press conference. <laughs> Honest to God, I heard that. I was like, the series is over. That's the geekiest thing. I the New York Saints, like yeah. what? 
And now you got, when the Saints go marching in, like the Islanders fans just hopped right on. Are we selling T-shirts yet for the Saints? Oh, yeah. We got New York t- New York Saints shirts on sale now. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was just a no-brainer. But what a nerd comment. Yeah. The Saints? Yeah. If you're going to say something, you can't say the New York Saints. I couldn't believe it. I thought there was a joke that I was missing. I'm like, no, he's like trying to call them Saints. I don't understand how you could go after that game and that be the message that you're going to portray. Like... Like I said, kill the penalties. And and what it, what does it do? What does it do when you go after the officials, right? You're thinking that like subconsciously they're going to like give you a call, right? That everyone knows you're upset. I think all the refs look at it like fuck you. Like uh, what are you doing? You're pissing them off even more for going at him. Like I don't think that that's going to change the way the game's refereed. I understand he was pissed off, but I I don't really see that. Maybe look at how bad your team played at home. We've seen a few cards pulled by the coaches this playoffs. We saw the Bednar calling out the boys, and that one backfired. They've lost. They've lost three in a row, and then you, <laughs> and then you see the going after the refs, and the bees lose three in a row. So yeah, can't be using those cards too early. You got to save those for maybe the semis or the finals. And then uh, anything else? In, any other notes on that game in, in, in general? All right. Uh- What's his face? Nick Ritchie also got a five thousand dollar fine for elbowing uh, Scott Mayfield, and also two. Uh, Cassie stuck up for Bergeron. He didn't like the fact that Trotz called him a cheater. Now I know you know everyone cheats on face offs, but you know usually people don't come out and call a future Hall of Famer a cheater. Like he that. didn't though. He said he. I, I completely agree. It's like he cheats at face offs. He's not saying the guy's a right. cheater. You know how much respect Barry Trotz has for Patrice Bergeron. Like that was it was just a weird off ice series in terms of like coaches comments and I don't know. I I, I think the Islanders played that series to a T. And what I look at when I look at this series is, I swear to God, the 2015 draft. The Bruins had three picks in a row. They went Zabrol, Zobrol, <laughs> Zabor- Zabrusque, and then Sheshin. Dude, all of them, and no, no disrespect to Zabrusque, it was a tough season, right? He's not getting a ton done. The other two, horrific. You know who the Islanders got after that? Barzell. But, and Bolivier. Oh, no. Look Look at the difference. I mean, Barzell and Trotz called him out, said we can't win if he's playing like if he's going to play like this to be in the series. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but he fucking took his game to the next level. And that Killer Bees line that Pirelli talks about, Bolivier, Nelson, and Bailey, holy shit. So that team is built by a guy who built teams to win in like the dead puck era with the New Jersey Devils, 95, 2000, 2003, whatever years they won it. 25 years later, this guy is still building teams the same way if with today's game. And like you said, like instead of winning 2-1, now they win 3-2. And they are so difficult to play against. And they know exactly their role for each guy. And their team is just deeper than Boston's. You look at Boston's third and fourth line, like they didn't get anything. And then look at the third and fourth line for the Islanders. Look how, look how, look how much Sezekis gets done when he's on the ice. Martin, they play these guys a lot. They're able to like get in the offensive zone, control the puck. The Bruins... How many times did you see a point shot from the Bruins with nobody anywhere? You see a point shot from the Islanders. There's three guys in the crease banging away. It's like Zajac's goal to start game six, make it one nothing. a bad rebound by Tuca, and then nobody's covering him, and it's just a ripped rebound right to the empty net. It's like, what the fuck? The, the way that they were able to out-muscle the Bruins all over the ice was so apparent, and when you look at the Bruins and right now and where they're going to go, they're not the big bad Bruins anymore. Look at look at 2011. What, that team won a certain way. That's ten years ago. But the Bruins, they don't have they don't have the guy. They don't have the toughness. They don't have these guys who are able to like. They don't have a team where they can roll four lines and, and out and out physical teams and just wear teams down. That's the Islanders now. So. In looking at me thinking the Bruins were going to win the series, I was looking at the first line and how much better that line is than really any line on the Islanders. No offense, but after that, it was a it was a whitewash. Yeah. I think the only thing that could have pushed us a little bit further, maybe Game Seven, maybe closer games, would would of course been having Carlo and Miller in the lineup just for that physicality on the back end. Those are some tough minutes to eat up. And, and they they really struggled when those guys left the lineup. There, there was a massive difference. Of course, Tuca on, on top of that as well. Um, Hall, I, I was impressed with Halsey in the first round. Yeah. Obviously, he had that big fight. But, you know, ultimately, you know, you talk about depth scoring too. I don't think maybe he brought his A game offensively. 
Um, you know, who, who are some other guys who should probably... Krejci didn't Co- do much. Yeah, that whole line, Hall, Krejci, uh, Smith, yeah. uh, Charlie Coyle didn't do much. Basically, none of the bottom six didn't. You mentioned Miller and Kahlo, and that Kahlo is a huge loss. That hurt the penalty killing, but it didn't really matter almost, I think, because the Bruins' depth was woefully overmatched. And then the goaltender, we go back to Valimov, and, and like we said, we, we actually texted, texted, texted yesterday, we have receipts, when you said Raska start, and I was like, I'm leery of this move. Like, I think after he gave up uh, four goals on 16 shots the game before, the coach comes out and says he's not 100%. At what point is is he below the yeah. threshold of being uh, 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 effective? So when you mentioned that yesterday, I, I thought... I don't know what the relationship is of that core group. I would imagine that they're confident in Rask and they want him to come back. Oh, yeah. The, the guys in the team love him. So, so maybe if Rask does want to play that game and maybe Cassie thinks, I don't think you're 100%, and then they go with Swayman, what message does that send? And, and maybe you end up losing him in free agency because then emotions but, come into play, which I get what you're saying. Yeah. You're like, you need to do what's best for the it, team at this moment. But you're also he also might think that that you know Tuca at eighty percent seventy percent might give them a better chance to win than than, than Swayman at a hundred and you're looking forward saying hey we got we got a banged up blue line maybe this isn't our year but moving forward for the next two three years when we think this core group is still going to be together and still have a chance to make that run they think that they need Tuca Rask in order to do it because we. You know, these types of goalies who have been in these situations and taken teams on runs, they don't, you know, they don't, they ain't growing on trees, man. You know, you could, you right. could, you could look to move to the next guy, but we yeah. know how that works out. And, and I think Cassidy said that when he went to Tuca and he said, I can play, that was it. He, right. he trusted but, a veteran. But, and and your, your point is like, maybe don't listen well, to him. Well, that's where a coach got to be a coach and say, all right, don't have loyalty to your guy because he's telling he's got it. Say, hey, this kid played his balls off all the time when we used him all year, Swayman. The team looked different in front of him. I mean, yeah, he had a small sample size, which isn't always a bad thing because the other team has very little tape to study on him. Whereas with Tuca, they know he's going to play butterfly and they can shoot upstairs on him. And also, too, Biz, when, they, when he puts him in the third period, uh, for, when they're down 5 2, this isn't garbage time in the NHL playoffs anymore. This is 20 fucking 21. You're still in the game. We've seen so many comebacks. So putting Swayman in, yeah, it's going to kick the team in the ass, hopefully. But he's also trusting him in that position that he can come back and get the win. He only saw three shots. He gave up one. So you can't say he played good or bad. I just thought, like, why start a guy at 75% if he's going to give us what he gave us the game before instead of the guy who's 100% and looks, I, again, it's a small sample size, but this kid looks like he's the future goalie for Boston. And then after the game, Tuca said, I could have made a couple more saves, definitely. Yeah, should have made a few of those saves, kept it tighter. And it's like, well, fucking clearly wasn't effective and he's probably going to need surgery. So it's like, yeah, man, Cassidy, like, he, maybe he was too loyal and, instead of saying, all right, who, what gives us the best chance to win the game? And fucking, I think it was clearly Swayman after what we saw the last two games. And you heard after, I think um, he was asked, Cassidy said, you know, Tuca for sure wasn't his best, but our whole team didn't play well enough to win. This was a team loss. And like, I don't ever hear him come out and say, I got to do a better job coaching. Yeah. He got he, out coached yeah. to the umpteenth degree. And let me tell you, if you're a fucking Washington Capitals fan, <laughs> have you seen what Barry Trotz has done since he's left your team? Why well, you gotta go there? Have you seen what the <laughs> Capitals have done? And you have, this Trotz guy, holy shit, is this guy a hockey coach. He is able to get out of he's able to get so much out of teams. Their sum is so much better than what is the word sums better than so, the sum is better than the Parts? Parts? Don't yeah. ask me. I don't yeah. think yeah. that's the saying. We're we're mushing it. We're <laughs> we're we're butchering it, which makes total sense with this podcast. But I think everyone gets the gist of what I'm saying. How? See, what has Trotz won? Six series since he got to the Islanders. Every year they fucking move on. Like it's just and. What? Well, I was going to say there's a there's a stat with uh, Lou Lamorello as far as how many times he's advanced. Emily Kaplan ended up tweeting it out. Gee, pull that up while Wit, Wit finishes his thought. Um, other thought. I'm sorry, I just kind of lost my train. Oh. Brock Nelson. Jesus Christ. This guy's now the current leader in the NHL in games where you can end the series, right? Clinching series. Clinching series, possible clinching series games. In 12 of them, he's got nine goals now. He shows up when the moment's at its brightest, when the games are at the biggest. This guy is so big, so strong, so fast, and he was outstanding. That whole line, I talked about him already, but... 
Yeah, I mean, you got to look at Trotz and how he's able to get these guys going and then look at Cassidy and look at what he's saying about the refs after Game 5 and look at the decisions he's making. And, yeah, they had injuries. And I will say this. If you're looking at the entire series, right, there was moments the Bruins dominated. I think 5-on-5, five five, the advanced stats said they really outplayed them in terms of scoring chances. Bruins also had a little bit of tough luck, right? I mean, you remember the uh, Game 2, I think two pucks went in off feet, right? Yeah. A couple went in off uh, Tonority. I think it was. Uh, that- Lazon, Lazon had a tough, Lazon, he had a, he had a tough series. Yeah, and it's like, so there's a bunch of different plays. They got, uh, Tenorti broke the stick, and, and it's just like, you look back, and there's some bad breaks, but in the end, your depth was dominated by the Islanders' depth. All right, Grinelli's got it. So talk about, this is the tweet, talk about consistency. Lou Amarillo has reached the semifinals slash conference finals in five different decades as a GM, once in the 80s, twice in the 90s, Three times in the 2000s, once in the 2010s, and twice in the 2020s. Now, and I've we've I've chirped Lou Lamarillo. I think he's an old guy, hardo, but fucking a. <laughs> can you not respect what this guy's done? He knows exactly how to build teams, how he wants to get teams, and then like a guy like Paul Mar- Paul Mary, who the Bruins have been trying would have loved to get. He goes out and gets them. How good was he? How four, good was he this series? Four goals, two assists. And an elbow to, I mean, yeah, a, uh, a shoulder to McAvoy's chin that wasn't called. Very interesting decision there not to call that with four refs in the ice. But Lou Lamorello can build winners, dude. And mainly we hate him because I'm a player he'd never want on his team and he won't let people, <laughs> and he won't let people come on our podcast. But yeah. fuck, the guy keeps everything in-house and they just win games. Um, we got to talk about the fans bringing it home. On Long Island, that performance in the third period, the last twenty minutes. Now, well, you it, said at my house, you go, you go, how great is this? That the game's pretty much over, and you can just celebrate and rip on the Bruins the entire twenty minutes. That was a twenty-minute stoppage time dump on the, party, dump, dump yeah. on their chess fest. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly then, what that was. The chance the whole way. I'm sure the Saints one came up. I couldn't hear it that clearly. I mean, the, Grinelli, the you New were York li- Saints chant. The New York Saints chant. They were doing that the entire it, third period. It. I just felt so degraded. Rated. It like, sounded like it sounded like European soccer. Shout out Chelsea, your uh, Champions <laughs> League champs. They were just singing the whole game. It reminded me of Nashville in like 2017. Like they were just partying the entire from start to finish, all game, entire barn going nuts. Yeah. So congratulations to yeah. them. I think they're going to bend over Tampa now too. I well, got- I'm actually I'm actually rooting. Um, got two empty for, net I'm rooting off. for the Islanders because then I can laugh even harder at them when they lose in the finals. I got uh, Islanders in, in in five against Tampa. Should we jump mm-hmm. over that series real quick or no? No, we okay. we, we we just said with you what are we going to do? I, mean, I love him business. That like, uh, his brain works. Captain his brain works in different Captain ways. Captain batting out of order. Uh, as far as the bees, we're going to you know ne- what's next up for the teams who are getting dumped. The Bruins got a lot of UFAs. Krejci, Hall. Corrali, Riley, Miller, and Raskin and Halak, they're two goalies from, from this year. Well, obviously, Swimming came in late. A couple of RFAs, Kashe, Richie, Frederick coming out of his entry level. Kashe, they gave and, him a first rounder for. Yep, so probably assume try to keep him. And then Carlo, too, is a RFA. Uh, Swayman and Vladar are both signed through 2023. So It's an interesting time for the Boston Bruins. Yeah. And I don't know if they got a couple runs left, if, if not one run left, but you also, like, Aren't crazy to think in two, three years, are they like rebuilding? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 where's Krejci going to be? Can they re sign Hall? Bergeron's getting older. He still looks awesome. Marshawn, one of the best players in the league. You can't put any fault on him for his effort this series. What a player. But Jesus Christ, did, the, did, did your depth just get completely, completely overturned by the Islanders? Yeah, Matt Basal, too. I don't know if you mentioned him, but three goals, three assists. He, he feasted on the Bees this series oh. as well. I mean, he's a stud, anyways, but he showed why. Yep. All right, boys. Well, today's athletes deserve more than just your grandfather's tired, old, salty sports drink, which is full of artificial dyes. Enter Body Armor. Made with potassium-packed electrolytes, antioxidants, and B vitamins, plus no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or dyes, Body Armor Sports Drink provides hard work and hydration and more, plus it tastes great. I have my strawberry watermelon. I'm sorry, strawberry banana around here somewhere. I can't find it. I'm also on the orange mango, berry lemonade, watermelon, strawberry is the number one flavor, though, Biz. You love that stuff. They actually came out with a new flavor called Leaf's Tears, and I'm actually drinking it right now in my Habs cup if you guys want to zoom in on that. I don't know if anyone's seen his outfit. I guess if Uh. you're listening in your car, there's no way you would have seen anything. My bad. Biz has a sweatsuit from the Montreal Canadiens, probably sent directly from their locker room, as well as a coffee cup. Yeah, this is team-issued apparel. So you're just switching right over. 
I, I, I think uh, I remember saying very clearly <laughs> in the middle of the season that I was very confident in the moves that Ber- Berger Van was making. And on top of that, and we'll get to it later, yeah. my boy Sean Burke. And, and let's, let's yeah. save it. Let's yeah. put it on the shelf. All right. And Body Armor helps today's athletes stay on top of their game. Body Armor, available, available for purchase in-store and on Amazon now. Learn more at drinkbodyarmor.com. Next, we're going to take a look at Vegas, Colorado. They had a Game 5 last night, pivotal Game 5. But before that, Biz, uh, the Kadri, Nazam Kadri suspension Uh-oh. was upheld per an independent arbitrator ruling. Uh, so he's still going to be out. Game 5, the uh, home team has won all five games so far. Vegas won 3-2 in OT. Mark Stone breakaway. Uh, just unbelievable game. Colorado looked like they had it in a bag. 2 nothing lead going into the third. A couple of uh, uh, bad misplays, a Burakovsky turnover in his own end, where Alex Tuck with yet another baseball goal ends up in the net. And then the Landeskog pass hits a skate. They go back the other way and tie it up. Well, the, the Kadri suspension being upheld is huge, right? So now Colorado has to force it to seven if they want him back in the lineup. And we know what the second line for the Vegas Golden Knights right now have been doing to the Colorado Avalanche, especially over the last three. We said that they played really well in game two and deserved to, to win as well. But it has been an absolute slaughter fest. Now, going to that first period, um, missed opportunity, wide open net for Ranton. And right afterward, he ends up getting that goalie interference call. I thought it was an absolute rubbish call. Kind of fucked with their feng shui because I thought they were pressing. But they end up getting that lucky goal late in that period. Brandon, uh, Brandon Sod. What a play by him. I think there was about three and a half seconds when he got the puck. Just to look up. He checked the fucking score clock. Yep. That's And, and he saw it, and then he takes that extra move. And I think uh, what uh, Memes described it as is the spezza move, <laughs> where you kind of go with the shot, and then you, you kind of keep pushing the puck. Completely changed the angle, got away from the defender's stick, and he throws. I don't want to say it was a muffin, because I thought he got pretty good, pretty good wood on that puck. But Mark, it was an awful goal. Though. It was an awful goal. Pecarine, I, I remember how he used to do the yes. crossbody glove save all the time, and he he, he mastered it. I, I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't pay attention enough to Flurry to see if he does it a lot. But maybe he maybe he just had a brain glitch. I think where, he had a brain fart. No he, joke. Brain fart. He goes with the crossbody glove save, and he just completely whiffs on it. And you could see his reaction right afterward. He. He's disgusted with himself. He throws a stick, picks it up, does the old figure eight to the corner like he normally does. And you're thinking, okay, Colorado's off and running. That's a big bounce given the fact that they missed that rant in an open net. And first goal has to be important for their confidence and psyche given the fact that they just got smoked the last two games. They go into that second period and they keep pressing. Now, the interesting quote that uh, after the game was Mark Andre Fleury, and uh, do you have it right there, R.A.? Uh, as far as the goal, yeah, just yeah, as far as the goal, because guys, we've seen this before from Mark Andre Fleury. I mean, credit Patrick O'Sullivan for being at the right place at the right time, but when he was with Team Canada, he ended up throwing one right off his body. They ended up losing that gold medal that they were supposed to win. So we've seen this type of gift from Flurry before, but... Yeah, he said, I think maybe when I was younger, this would have thrown me off a bit more, but I've been around a bit. Guys had my back on the locker room, and that felt good. I always believe in this group that we can come back and... (laughs) Well, I mean, so his performance in that second period is the only reason that they were still in that hockey game. I know it was 2 nothing, and they ended up potting one more. I, I, who, who ended up getting Don Scoy got the other one on a great pass from Newhook, who oh, played yeah. at BC this year. It shows Col- Colorado's depth. But Flurry, that quote was so interesting because to bring up how when you're younger it would really rattle you is, is – is, I'm not impressive, but almost like he's realized how much he's grown. And the immediate thing I thought was like, I remember playing with him. Granted, it feels like 30 years ago I was playing with Marc Andre Fleury, but he would come in the room, and if he gave up a goal like that, he would feel so bad, and he'd, he'd like apologize to the team. And I'm sure he did the exact same thing. Like, guys, I'm sorry, I'm, you know. But right away, that team's so close. They all love the guy. You can only imagine. Don't worry, Flower. We got you. We got you, buddy. Hey, we're going to get two or three. Don't, no worries. No worries. So, like, that team being that close and being that confident, even being t- down two going to the third, it shows their resolve. It shows how good of a coach DeBoer is. And it shows that right now they are just gelling at the perfect time. It's a deep team. And when you do see a goalie, your star goalie, let in a real shit goal and not a must win, but the biggest game, you win game five. I don't know the percentage. I think it's 75% of the time you win the series to see that happen late in a period it could kill teams and it didn't it didn't and they didn't come out and get the lead back in the second but they stuck with it and stuck with it and flurry he just kept kicking and played awesome well and, and on top of that I think he had a big save right at the beginning of that third period right before Alex Tuck ends up going down now you said that it was a it was a turnover out just outside the blue line yeah so Landis Gog are you talking about on their second goal on the first one 
with with the, Alex Tuck. The, the Tuck that was a Burakovsky turnover in his own in zone. His own he, zone. He, he he made the he didn't make the safe play. Lost it. Did not, he didn't re, never even got it out of the zone. Um, oh shit! I figured, I had the assist written down. Whoever got it to to Tuck and Tuck batted out of out of midair. That was Roy. Did, a, Roy. Did. Roy. That's right. Okay. Roy. And and then like Marsha show he ties it up with. A beautiful. He go, he's in tight. He goes up top, like just the perfect shot at, at that moment. And at that point, it's like, oh my god, they came back. They fucking tied it up. Colorado's at home. You got a two goal lead in the third. And then right away, you know what? What are they saying after the game? Three games in a row, Nathan McKinnon doesn't have a point. I think he's got five shots in the last three games, right? So for a guy that's right there in terms of best players in the world, like you just can't have it happen. And and right now, when you talk about depth and the Bruins' lack of. Losing Kadri is just a killer to this team because they're kind of a one-line team right now. And instead of that second line, having Kadri, um, maybe Burakovsky or, or Kompfler on the side with their other winger, you know, who usually, right, is Landeskog, it's just a different second line. But now it's Nikush- Nikushkin's playing on the second line. The third line's Tyson Joes, Burakovsky, and O'Connor. It's like... Kadri just changes an entire unit that you have on the ice, not only offensively but defensively. So right now you have t- you have Vegas who rolls four lines, three of them playing great hockey, and Colorado's got one. So it's like the depth issue is all it is about in the NHL playoffs, and that's why Tampa's the best fucking team in the world because every single line keeps coming. So Colorado to get nothing from McKinnon makes me think in Game Six tonight he'll show up. He has to. He ha- he has to. He has That's to. what it comes down. And if he doesn't, he's going to catch the what? heat. No points in his last three, minus three. Yeah. Yep. And that's, yeah. That's and I just... think Rantanen has a goal and an assist in those last three games, but it's still, it's just not good enough. But when you're the only line that's able to produce anything, and then you're getting shut down, you just look around at the team. It's like, we are, they are a different team than the regular season and at the first five, six games of this playoff. Um, the other question mark I had, and I don't know if he's completely healthy. I heard that about, what? Three four weeks ago, he got cleared, and he, he started practicing with the with the guys. Bo Byram, I, I I don't know if they're trying to protect him because he he is a maybe a, maybe a little bit undersized. But I said when I watched him play this year, he played above his size. He plays a physical type game. He can move the puck. I've been a little bit disappointed in a few of the guys on the back end for for the Abs. And given the way they've played in the last three games, I'm surprised that they haven't tried to insert him. I mean, we saw the. I, I mean, I think Graves has been solid, but... The, the, I don't think Graves, Taves, or Makar, or Gerard are coming out. But when you look at the bottom pair... Well, ne- I think if, I think Nemeth, if you, you swap them out for Nemeth. I don't get it. And Nemeth, I think the thinking is... Say think again. I believe that Nemeth is big guy, and you look at Stone and, and how physical that the Fair. entire Vegas team can be, and Tuck's enormous. You're like, all right, let's get some size in there. Maybe get in a top five pick who moves the puck as well as anyone and could skate like the wind and just at least get him in. I don't know if he's going to see game six and coming back off injury and then just being thrown into the playoffs as a young guy is certainly something they may be worried about. you got to change something. You've lost three in a row, and you probably should be out of the series already because game two, Vegas deserved to win. I think Vegas closes it out tonight, but as you guys know, I'm never really right. Um, the the comments by Tuck after the game. Now, I think that Stoner... What a player he is. St- Jesus st- Christ. Stoner was at the end of his shift, and it did look like he was sucking back some wind going up ice, but him and that elephant knob, he ended up getting down there, and he got a nice clean shot off at the end of his shift, didn't he? Oh, he, uh, you're talking about the winner? The winner. Oh, oh, it was a fucking snipe. And the craziest <laughs> thing is, at the end of the game, I don't know if there was under 30 seconds, it was under a minute, he walked Devon Taves. And he had a, a great chance, and Taves, last-ditch effort, just got a stick on the puck. It was a good play after getting burnt. But I'm like, oh, I thought Stone was going to end that thing in regulation. Actually, somebody tweeted R.A. I think you tweeted it out. He had, I think, Vegas uh, live down 2-0 in the third. was like plus. That was some ra- a, a random list that he bet. Plus 3,000. 30-1, to 1, he had Vegas when they were down 2 nothing. but they had to win in regulation. And so Stone and then- almost did it. But, but then the play, sorry, all right. No. Then the play that you're talking about, when you see hockey IQ, which so many players lack, they have all the skills in the world, but they can't think the game where Stone is just at another level. The puck's a little bit turned over, right? And what does he do? He just takes off. Opens up, He yeah. takes off, and he, he got a great pass, and then all of a sudden he goes down and just shelf. It was the perfect shot. You know, you needed a save from Grubauer there, but you really can't blame him when you pick a corner like that. And boom, 3-2, and they're going back to Vegas looking to close yeah, out. Yeah, maybe, maybe I was being a little too critical of Graves there, but I will say he, he did the Patrick Marlowe special that you did. He, he buried two right in the guy's shin pad. 
That's Nick the wit. Back the other way. That's the wit. <laughs> hey, wit, you got to yeah. we got to work on getting pucks through. <laughs> Shin pad, other net. <laughs> Oh, hits his skate. Shit. Other way. Two on one. And then the net. The, the net and then front, I slide into the goalie. And, and then the forward net front taking cross checks to, to earn that space in front, just rolling his eyes at you. And, and then when you look at Vegas, right, and how they're able to play. And I don't think Vegas and the Islanders are that dissimilar in terms of like the Is that way- a word? Dissimilar? Yes. Yeah. Ooh. I don't think that they're that different in, in a sense like. They never change the way they play. They continue on the path, no matter the score, until late in the game. If you got to get a couple, they'll open it up. But they've really kind of, I'm not going to say slowed down Kale McCarr, but he doesn't look like, you know, the Kale McCarr from the regular season or the Kale McCarr from the first round because they're just taking away time and space. It's all they do. It's the same thing as the Islanders. They don't give the best players room to make plays. So you've seen it with McKinnon. You've seen it with their best defensemen. They need more, and they need it tonight. That was a hell of a pass from Pat Chiretti, too, to send Stone in. And the quote from Tuck, uh, Biz, he was exhausted, and you saw how hot he skated down the ice. He's the hot and soul of the team. He's the captain that we've always wanted. Mr. Mr. Exuberance. And that picture I tweeted out, awesome photo yeah. of him jumping into mid-air. Pat Chiretti's midair with the fucking screaming in the face. Just awesome stuff. Uh, and go back to that bet that kid made, too. The, he ended up losing. It was regulation. And then some idiot chirped him. He's like, oh, because the guy cashed out early. So he actually made money. And, got, and some idiot tried to chirp him. He's like, oh, you fool. And I'm like, buddy. The other fool here, and he's like, "Oh, you won't tell me what it is." I'm like, "Asshole!" He's like, "I don't gamble." I'm like, "Well, why would you jump into a Twitter feed and call a guy a fool for taking money, and you don't even follow gambling? You fucking idiot, man! People, so many mutants. On Twitter Fuck lately, him, man. No, me and what was talking about him. early? Twitter was just loaded with mutants. But I, I, I'm getting tight with the Islanders fans. I told you, <laughs> I'm rooting for oh, them. I got, hey, I got 17 to one on them. I told you when they were two two with Pittsburgh, uh, the Islanders 17 to one. I threw a few bucks actually, on them. So. If, the, if the Islanders play Montreal for the Cup, I'm I'm done. I'm done. I'm not, wa- I'm not watching <laughs> yeah, the game. We're going we're to find a new uh, When I come on the pod <laughs> after the finals, every I'm going to talk about my golf if I'm back playing. Yeah, I'm not talking about Islanders Montreal. Fuck you guys. And Montreal fans, Jesus Christ. Hey, watch your mouth. Jesus, we'll get to them. <laughs> Fucking hey, These people, the Montreal fans are yeah. painful. I didn't know that. I never had a problem with Montreal fans. I think I'm up to six teams fan base who hate me and I hate them. Montreal's now on the list. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. We got to finish stroking off Mark Andre Fleury. A couple of huge saves in OT on Landeskog, then comp from the rebound. Biz, he's now tied for fourth overall playoff wins with Monday's guest Billy Smith and Eddie Belfour. Patrick War, of course. Leads. Wait, 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 wait. Do you know who the other three are? Oh, sorry. Pardon? Do you, do you know who the three are for playoff wins? Uh, goaltenders a- ahead of him, Martin Brodeur, mm-hmm. Patrick Wah. Mm-hmm. How how am I forgetting number one? It's probably so obvious. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, number no, one is Patty Waz. Waz one. No, but I'm thinking two. the other yeah, guy okay. must yeah, be so yeah. obvious. Uh, we had him on recently. Billy Smith? <laughs> Grant Fuhr. <laughs> Grant Fuhr. Wow, yeah, I should have thought of the Islanders dynasties. I was starting to think like Canadians dried in, but then they didn't play as many I don't games. Think, and- I don't think anybody is ever going to beat Waz. He's how many more games ahead right now? He's got 115 for wins. 151 playoff wins. Oh, 151. <laughs> yeah. and, he's and, fought, so 63 ahead of the current that's active fucking leader. That's crazy. And he's yeah. the only goalie in top five career playoff wins that also, when coaching, punched the glass and tried to fight Bruce Boudreau because he had sauce in his, his shirt. first game. <laughs> Because he could, because he did. He's like, clean up your collar, Bruce. Hey, he's like, you do two trips to the buffet in the fucking lounge before I you get my first. You fucking game me? Are you fucking kidding me? You fucking game me, man? That bell neck. <laughs> call this. Is that the swear? Yeah, call this. Call this tabernacle. That's what I heard from Terry. <laughs> tabernacle. Uh, Biz, Yenmark got back on the lineup and he replaced Ryan Reeves, who was the health bomb. And I know you wanted to yeah, talk for, about that. First guy in the tunnel just. Giving his boys hugs on the way in. T- typical team guy, Revo. Fuck. Th- th- I figured I'd give my, my fourth line buddy a shout out. Uh, any final notes on that series, boys? Did, do you want to share before you move along? No, just that through five games, uh, with game six being tonight, Vegas is significantly a better hockey team. Yeah. It, was, it was one game after playing game seven two nights prior, and since then, Vegas has fucking owned them. Well, hey, the ball's in your court, Vegas fans. Can you sing your team home to victory just like the Islanders did, we'll be watching. Um, not sure if you guys can bring it to that that cadence. Yeah, we'll been, see. Yeah. You don't think the Vegas crowd can get as loud? Yeah, well, as the I guess we'll see. There's when, more yeah. fans. I guess we'll There's see. more fans. They're known as the craziest, loudest fucking fan base in the league. You're wrong, Biz. You stick to the Canadians and you're 300 people in the stands. All right, before we get get to the Canadians Jets, we do want to mention, I guess, Colin Blackwell. We're going to bring him, him on a little bit. New York Ranger, we talked to him. Where was the uh, World Championships there? It was Where? over in Riga, Latvia. Riga, Latvia. Okay. Um, 
probably the hottest girls per capita in any city in the country. I hope the guys had fun. Actually, I don't think they did. They were in a bubble. But Colin Blackwell has been through more to get where he's at now than I ever knew. And I think it's going to be a really interesting interview for people to hear from a, a 2021 Masterton nominee. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, we got to discuss the Montreal Canadiens, Winnipeg Jets, uh, another stunner of a series. They have sweeped them. I don't think anybody saw a sweep coming, even with, with or without Shifley. Uh, they win game four, 3-2 in OT. Wit, Biz, who else? But Tyler Toffoli and a one-timer from Cole Caulfield to win it. Biz, what do you got on this one for us, buddy? Well, first, first Biz. So we see the get-up, and we hear, since I've known you, Toronto Maple Leafs, a Toronto kid. Like, what is going on here? Are well, you trying to jinx them? No, it's Canada's team. I don't know if you saw. I don't know. If Come you... on with the CN Tower, Canada. Uh, what the brutal. fuck? That's what I was just going to say. Trudeau's got the whole country <laughs> rooting. He forced them to change the color. So I obviously am jumping on the bandwagon. Now, let's go back to a couple months ago when I said this was all going to change when – not only they brought in Ducharme, but that was Eric Engels who came on and told us that he thought he was prepared and he was going to be able to will this team to victory. Now, who was the other coach that they brought in? Uh, a man Do you remember? Named, a man named uh, Sean uh, Bur- 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 Burke. The goalie whisperer. Legit the goalie whisperer. Hey, Bryce. <laughs> Start being yourself again, Cook. Just carry. Just stop more pucks than than you've been doing lately. I think we're going to be okay. Just, and look at the turnaround the this team has had. Can we get his numbers over the last seven games, please? We got, uh, we got seven games. Uh, the last seven games, Carey Price has played since they were down 3-1 to Biz's beloved Maple Leafs. He's gone 7-0. and His um, goals against is 1.64, and his save percentage is 9.43. You are looking at a man possessed right now. And that's where it all begins, with the goalie whisperer, Sean Burke, telling him to stop the puck more, and he's done it. And when's the last time that the Montreal Canadiens won six playoff games in a row? In 93, when they won the Stanley Cup, and now they got seven to close out a series. They are going to be full of energy going into the next round, and I don't really care who it is, Vegas or Colorado. Are you picking them as well? Canadians in four. Okay, so you got the Islanders in five against the best team in the world, and you got the Canadians in another sweep. The craziest stat I've seen is I believe it's over 450 minutes now since the Canadians have trailed. They haven't even fucking been yeah. down in a game since since game uh, four. Well, we should actually roll Blake Wheeler's comments right now. He had a pretty uh, a pretty heartfelt post game press conference, emotional, or, or maybe a, a season wrap up conference, the same one where where Shifley was uh, chirping a little bit at the league again. <laughs> but he 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 said those exact words. Roll it right now. You know, with, with the goaltending that they have, um, any breakdowns or you know, he, he he's putting out those fires. Um, and, you know, we just couldn't get the first goal. We just couldn't do it all series. And uh, that plays right into their hands, you know. Uh, they have, you know, especially their, their top four defense and are big and heavy. And, um, you know, they 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 do a good job of just clearing pucks and throwing them out of the zone. And, um, you know, we, we just, we just like I said, I, I really felt like in any of these games, you know, probably – Probably outside the first one, uh, games two through four, if we just could have found a way to get that first goal, you know, could be a different series, but um, but we didn't. And you, you, you just got to give them so much credit. They, they, uh, they're playing unbelievable right now. Just how they were unable to ever get the lead. It's they could they couldn't score that first goal. He said that he said that he didn't feel as a team they were that far behind. It was just the minute that they gave up that first goal. Montreal did a hell of a job of locking things down. We also saw. Uh, uh, an unreal performance in game four as far as like, what What do they outshoot them by fucking 20? 42 to 16 in uh, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota. Much of 39 minutes in the Ozone. Winnipeg only had 17. <laughs> I mean, just domination. So they weren't even getting, Winnipeg, I mean, as great as Price was, Winnipeg wasn't even getting too many quality chances because once, once Montreal gets that lead, they just sit on it, man. They got the big D. They keep everybody out from out front and they fucking, and you got Price on the, on the last line, man. I would probably uh, say one of the biggest unsung heroes of the playoffs so far, in, in a sense of maybe what expectations were coming in, Joel Armia. Oh. No, no points, seven games coming into playoffs. And then you go, look back to game five against the Leafs. He ends up having two goals and an assist. That that was kind of the, the turning point and what has propelled them to this seven-game win streak. And what what I would imagine is the, the game where maybe the Jets could have got any hope back this series, game three. Two short fucking handed goals. 
This guy's got what now? Four goals and three assists, seven points in ten games. Oh. This guy is, I believe, he's an unrestricted free agent. You go yep. from not even knowing if you're going to get an NHL contract maybe next year to now, dude. This guy might be getting a fucking. Uh, he might be getting a Tyler Toffoli special now. Four years at four and change, whatever he's making. So talk about a guy who stepped up at the perfect time because they have not been getting offense from all the guys that they were expecting to get offense from coming into playoffs. I know that we've we mentioned Josh Anderson. I still think he only has one assist so far in in, in the in the in what in the nine games that they've played or ten games. His, that sti- they've... his stick has a couple goals via or at least one goal via Perry. That's that's <laughs> true. So, sorry, yeah. I, I was fumble fucking on the game situation, but. That, those are the types of guys you need to step up. And they even get it done in game four um, against the Jets without Petrie, who who missed uh, the game because of that finger in the hole. Okay, now. <laughs> That's what she said. I think that uh, Armia is – I'm not going to say showing you know why he was drafted so high. I mean that's a first round pick with Buffalo. Shocker, it didn't work out with the fucking Sabers. <laughs> but now now he's in Montreal and he's adding to the depth. So you got to talk about Bergevin and you got to talk about his celebration. And you saw him up top and he sprinted down. He's hugging all the guys. I think I think he was just giving everyone hard high fives. But he was so fired up. Caulfield hugs him. Perry walks in after that. It's like we just we just swept the Winnipeg Jets to win the North. Nobody saw this coming, and Montreal got up to a rocket start at the beginning of the season. And then things really did slow down, and you saw the coaching change and everything that was happening, and now they've just completely peaked at the right time. But to look at that first line, right? So you have you have Deneau, and then you have Gallagher, who's just such a rat to play against. And talk about crashing the crease and scoring goals in the, in, in the dirty areas. Gallagher's a professional at that. And then Lekkinen, and they're just able to just shut lines down. No, you lose Shifley, right? I think right then, you know, you're probably not winning the series. I mean, the guy's the center on one of the best lines in hockey, and they Wheeler and, and, and Connor weren't able to do anything without him. And I think that you got to give credit to that line, but you got to give credit to Bergervan and all the signings he made, and he did a lot of he made a lot of difficult decisions in terms of firing. He a was coach. getting laughed off stage by by half the fan base. I know, but to bring to bring in to bring in Perry, who's obviously played great again in another playoff, and then to just make different changes to a team that you had to change, and to bring in Edmondson, who's looked really good on D. And Petrie had an unreal regular season, and losing him, hopefully he's healthy, but he's got time to rest now before Vegas or Colorado, whoever wins that. Doesn't matter. They don't even need it. Yeah, yeah, it's another sweep. I forgot. Sorry, we shouldn't even play the games. But Suzuki's playing phenomenal, and Caulfield finally got into the fucking lineup. You look at now, would they have beat Toronto earlier if they had this guy? What an assist he makes on the series-clinching goal to Toffoli, and then Toffoli's another signing. So it's like all these guys that Bergevin brought in and wanted to change the culture with, they've been able to do it. So the good thing is you're moving on without maybe your best forward and Anderson doing anything. So that's kind of shocking. If you heard Anderson's numbers, what they'd be at now, you'd say no chance they win the North. But they're getting depth and they're getting goal. They have depth and they're getting goaltending. So when you when you think about the least tier body, at least tiers body armor blend, you got the fact that Lou's advancing to the conference final. They let him go. Uh, you got the fact that they've taken over the CN Tower in Toronto. That's and, just such a tough one. Uh, that's and, brutal. And, and of course, they've eliminated the Toronto Maple Leafs. So there you have it, folks. Leafs tiers. Body armor, the new, the new special cocktail for all Dude, you people in Montreal. Biz actually just, Tabarnak! Let's call it just come over the wire here, Biz. Four, actually, four Canadians are on the DL right now because Bergevin patted them on the backs too hard. He, oh. he put him on the DL from yeah. beating on him. Dude, he's fucking jacked, dude, when he was doing that. Well, he's, he probably like gonna, he's probably going to sign a 10-year deal if he wants one now. <laughs> I mean, people were saying he was gone if they didn't make the playoffs or lost first round. Now look at him. They're champions of the North. The North is pretty the pathetic. Bud, the, pretty pathetic. The Budweiser, Budweiser Canada North. Budweiser division. Canada North. Our friends over at Budweiser Canada. But here's my thing with Canadians fans: be so proud of this team, and you have this world class goalie who's figured it out, and you're moving on, and you have a chance. But you are crazy if you can't admit you've gotten a little lucky throughout this playoffs. And, and it's weird when you say that to a fan base; they take so you're an English they pick. take so much offense to it that getting lucky. <laughs> You beat Toronto with, with, without one of their best players. Tavares left game one. You didn't have to deal with him, and you did a great job. You shut down Matthews and Marner. You then beat Winnipeg without their best player. I mean, things have gone your way. Things have gone your way, and you should be able to at least as a fan base admit 
we are playing well, but we've also got some bounces. And if you can't admit it, as a new Canadian an sort player. of Leafs fan, you're a fucking piece of shit no, you're trash an bag pick. from okay. Canada. Okay. You nope. might as well have a trash bucket breakfast sandwich with fucking R.A.'s uncle oh. while talking about the shitbag Canadian Leafs like fandom you, you now have. No Tatar. He's healthy scratch. Okay, okay that's that, not that's not bad luck. They're they're deciding to scratch him. That's okay. not losing your two best players that you're playing against are two of the best. Drew N. They lost Drew N. He ended up having to leave for for. Personal. They don't even they don't even want him in the lineup. Petrie finger in the box. One game. Finger You've in gotten the hole. a little lucky. That's all I'm saying. The Canadian fans. It, it, it's so weird as a fan base. You can't be like, yeah, we've gotten a couple bounces so far. We haven't had to deal with two of the best players on both teams we've beat. Well, I'll consult with the rest of the fan base. Okay, you do that. You. you fucking speak your French. Uh, speaking of Habs and Burger Van, we are going to be dropping some merch uh, on the website and on Twitter. So keep your eyes open, Canadians fans. We got some stuff coming. Uh, and going back to the Shifley loss, Winnipeg got just four goals after losing him, and their power play was outscored three to nothing by Montreal's <laughs> penalty killing. Uh, you mean Joel Armia? Yeah, uh, and who, by the way, who was a former, Joel, who Joel. was a former Winnipeg Jet too? They actually traded him to Montreal a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, just uh, the Shifley quote. Where is it? Oh, yeah, I I thought I was going to be tried to be shut down by Philip Deneau, said Shifley. Instead, it was Department of Player Safety that shut him. Zinger. Down. When the Saints come marching. In. Well, so it was it was it was obvious to say that the Winnipeg Jets and Mark Shifley didn't agree with the decision. Uh, a lot of people thought it'd be two games, but it ends up being four, and boom, there go, boom goes the dynamite, as the <laughs> legendary viral clip says. The Jets go down, and they went down hard. Now, interestingly enough, in the postseason kind of wrap up press conference, uh, Connor Hellebuck, phenomenal goalie. He mentioned that they're close to being a dynasty. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck he's smoking. He's on some RA biz type stuff. Up right now, and he's trying to figure out that he's close to a dynasty. They went to the Western Conference Finals once three years ago. I don't know what's going on there. They are nowhere close to a dynasty. I like their team, and I think Wheeler or Shifley said, you guys counted us out from the beginning of this year. We ended up having a good year. We had True. some tough luck, uh, but in the end, that's not a dynasty. <laughs> that is not even close to a dynasty, so I respect Connor Hellbuck believing in his boys, but that was crazy. Yeah, I think they are set up pretty good uh, forward and goalie. The defense they still got to work on. Hellebuck, 2.23 goals against, 9-3-1 save percentage in eight games. He's got three seasons left on his deal. Uh, Connor has five. Ehlers has four. Shifley, three. Wheeler, three. Adam Lowry got five. Uh, Josh Morrissey signed for seven more. Dylan DeMello, three more. Uh, as far as UFAs, Stastny, I mean, he's 35. I don't know if he's going to be back. Perot, Thompson, Ben, Forbert. Uh, Laurent Brosseau, the goaltender. And for RFAs, they got uh, Kopp, Pionk, and Stanley, who uh, the defenseman got two goals in the game the other night. So you so. want to sign all those guys. Kopp's a nice player. I just, yeah. I'm just, i just saying. I, uh, yeah, they're not a dynasty. There was one thing I failed to uh, There was one thing I failed to mention last podcast. I was a little bit uh, critical of Dubois, and I guess maybe the lack of production. <sighs> he, mm. he, he did miss the first game of playoffs this year. I don't know. I don't know if he was battling through injury. Oh, you no, got I, it? I got the quote after we talked. Oh, okay. We talked there you last go. night. Yeah, he said, "No, I'm not hurt. I mean, I'm as hurt as anybody. Bruises and scratches and stuff like that. Nothing major that affected my game. No goals in 24 games played after Columbus traded him. Uh, three assists in seven games in the, in the playoffs and invisible. I mean, he, he didn't had- score a goal." No, no, that, that Wait, he, he didn't no, have a, he yeah. didn't have oh, a goal so. in his last twenty four games. Twenty four games. All right, yeah, the, but okay. I mean that's still. Oh my yeah, god, that's, oh that's my a, god. I mean, let's let's be oh honest. Oh my god, in twenty four games, he probably would put up as much ice as I would in two seasons. <laughs> so that would be like me not scoring goal in two seasons, which I don't know if I've ever went that long of a run. So it's kind of like yeah, and I, mean, I also he, he never chased the Emmy. He never chased the Emmy with a knee drop in San and San Jose. I ain't getting power play time either. Yeah, you so, got, you should have been net front man. You got screwed. He said, I, I didn't play how I thought I could and how I know I can. The only person to blame is me. Uh, and he's got one more year left at five million. Uh, well, I like the peg. accountability. Yeah. So I hope he listen. I think that if he's able to find his game, and sometimes when you come over to, I know. from a different team in, a, in in this whole weird year and how it all played out, I know he had to he had to also sit out a couple weeks when he first got there too. So maybe that took him out of his rhythm. But either way, that's a, an important piece that if they want to create this dynasty that Hellebuck's talking about, they're going to need him to contribute more than no goals in the last twenty four games, especially come playoff time when Shifley's out. Yeah, that was the one moment you're like, okay, all right, 
step it up, dude. Yeah. We need you. And, and he wasn't able to. But I did really respect putting it on himself and, and saying, no, I'm, a, I'm as injured as anyone else is right now. He didn't make excuses. And like you said, he had to do the quarantine when he went. He wants to be in Winnipeg. It's where his parents live. So let's look at the offseason. And you really wouldn't be surprised to see him come back and have a great year next year. And then the, di- then the dynasty begins. <laughs> Uh, Tyler Toffoli, four goals, six assists in 11 games. Outside of Price, uh, I'd say probably the best Canadian. Uh, no doy, and, but- and he's a guy who you're able to watch and, and in, the, in the new age of just burners on guys and being able to skate so well. It's, it's not his strength, but he's so smart. You mentioned the hockey IQ and you mentioned his release. He's able to shoot it from anywhere. He's kind of mastered that like curl and drag, shoot it through a stick, shoot it through the defenseman's feet, and then... To have Caulfield playing and, and dishing it like he did on the winner for the series is just a – he's a great player. And, it, and and the season he's had, I believe he was on pace for close to 50 goals. So good for him. I think I saw a picture online as uh, his girlfriend sent out – or maybe he's married to her uh, – after the game bringing his dog. It was like a little lap dog for a walk. So I thought it was pretty cute. I he's I walking his dog. He puts the dog in like a baby carriage to go for a walk yeah, with it. That's yeah, a, I respect that. Like move. Paris Hilton, he had him as the, the, old, uh, the old lap dog. Um, uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, looking at all these cars, we're right above the uh, the, bridge, the bridge tunnel here in Boston. And, you know, if, I don't know if you're going to have any car issues or you got to pay for anything. What, what do you got for us? Yes, R.A., we are talking cars and we are talking all of mechanical breakdown coverage. We all know auto manufacturers' warranty only goes so far. Everyone knows, when's my warranty up? When's my warranty up? Am I going to get hosed with a flat tire? So what happens when your warranty expires? When your engine or transmission fails? Who pays for that? Everyone knows you do. And unless you have all of mechanical breakdown coverage, you're screwed. Pushy salespeople and the robocalls are the absolute worst. Everyone hates them, but not with all of all of dot com. All of mechanical breakdown coverage says hell no to those unwanted robocalls that everyone can't stand picking up. All of covers 10 model years and newer and up to 140,000 in mileage. Across the U.S., people are keeping their cars longer. Get coverage that goes the distance. It's BBB A-plus rated, probably triple B A-plus rated, but I like saying BBB. And all of services, the majority of auto brands sold in the U.S., including luxury brands like Mercedes and BMW with RA drives. Coverage across the U.S. and Canada. You get a quote and purchase 100% online, or you can talk and coverage or you can talk to a coverage advocate. It's your choice. And stay tuned for new sweeps, sweepstakes announcing in June 14th for a chance to win a trip for two to the 2021-2022 NHL Jewel event. And listen, here, to save you money, Olive.com, the official mechanical breakdown coverage partner of the NHL. Visit Olive.com slash chicklets to set your price today. Well done. I, haven't, I got rid of my car a couple of years ago. I don't need a car. I work from home, live in the city. Random Ubers. I was going to ask you, do you have a driver's license? Oh, yeah. No, no he's a, I, you know, he's a driver. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It's a guy yeah. Rick, Guy Ricky grew up yeah. with. He just drives him everywhere. No, no, I've had a license for, fuck, thir- 33, 34 oh, years. Best. Yeah. No, I got. I don't need a car, though. Good just job getting a license. Yeah. yeah. I got on her pretty early. All right, boys, moving right along. Tampa Bay, Carolina series. I thought this was going to be a much more entertaining series. Probably even last a couple games longer. But Tampa finished them off in five. They won game five, two nothing to take the series. Uh, Carolina's goaltending less than Stella. I know Nadelkovich was pretty good in game five, but Vasilevsky was unreal. I think he might have let up one bad goal the whole time. Uh, Braden Point, this kid is just unreal. Steps it up in the playoffs. Averages .40 goals per game during the regular season. That goes up to .55 goals per game in the playoffs. .88 points per game in the regular season. Goes up to 1.13 points per game in the playoffs. In his last 31 playoff games, he's got 21 goals, 21 assists. I mean... His, today's, he's today's stroke off session. And we talk about how important those first goals are of the game in playoffs. I think earlier in the season, or early in the season, earlier in the series, he scored the first goal yep. of the game. And then, of course, in the closing out in game five on a sick poise. I mean, sick poise. Kalorn has turned into a, the, the Palat of this year. Now he's got fucking 12 points, but he slides that over and he goes to his backhand to beat Nadelkovic. And it's just like. Like under those high pressure situations in playoffs, the fact that he could just slow the heart rate down and go <laughs> walk around, just fucking silky backhand, right top cheese. How's the mama? Keep the fucking keep the change, and and they're off and running. And then you mentioned Vasilevsky; he ends up closing the door. Now, what's uh, what's crazy about his numbers are in the last three games to close out a series. 
Yeah, he stopped all 29 shots for his third career playoff shutout, all three coming in clinching game scenarios, all in the last three series, 8-3 and three with a 2-2-4, two, 9-3-4 two, save percentage, and two shutouts. And him, it looked like him and Brendan Moore had a, had a uh, not an animated chat, just a, a little bit of a kind of a nice chat. Yeah, he said, we're trying to address goaltending. You want to come over to Carolina? <laughs> well, he said after the game, he said, I've been around this league a long time, and he, I think he's the best goalie I've ever seen. That's I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He's like he does it as well as anyone I've ever seen. And how do you disagree with him? He's so big, so mobile. He makes it look so easy. He never really has to make a crazy, fantastic save because he's so big and he just sits there and it hits him. His angles are perfect, and that's why when you talk about this team, it's like. I don't know how many times you can say every fucking line can score. Every line can produce pace of play and play in the offensive zone. They're dear. They got three stud left defensemen, and then they have the best goalie in the world. So you look at every team left. You look at every team in the league before the regular season. They are the best on paper, and they are the best on the ice. They have so many different ways to beat you, and they have so many different types of style to play. And then when all of it breaks down, and in the end, every team has moments of weakness and breakdowns, you have this fucking goalie who makes it look so simple and so easy that even Rod Brindamore, an all-time great player and a great coach, you can tell he's intense and the guys and love a him, is sitting there and a tamperer <laughs> trying to get Vasilevsky to, to request a trade to Carolina. He's sitting there. It felt like it was like three minutes long, right? Like he was blatantly like pointing him in the chest like we couldn't beat you. I don't know what he said, but it had to be, I can't tell you how impressed I am and there was nothing we could do. Because you say, R.A., you were hoping for a different series. I actually think, like, some of the games were pretty good. I mean, zero the, the game the other night, the closing game, it wasn't a high-scoring tilt, 2 nothing final, but it was a good game. And Vasilevsky made some huge saves, and the first two games of that series could have easily gone the other way for Carolina, right? They were closely matched, and Carolina could have got one of them, but when you lose two at home, we said right away that was it. We thought it maybe goes six and ends up going five. No yeah, problem. That's, that's the one thing that stuck out, although uh, low-scoring opportunities at both ends. Like, Carolina yeah. was still, you know, putting up some high-quality scoring chances chances at the other end now uh back to my comment earlier about that Patrick Waugh number of 151 career playoff wins not being touched maybe I'm dead wrong because Vasilevsky is still very young and he's on this juggernaut team who likes to cheat and manipulate the cap and they seem <laughs> to find them their way making runs every year I'm so. so amazed at people who like you know you talk about Tampa and Bunch it, of cheaters. It, it's Twitter they're cheating they're cheating they their, cap, their cap's 96 million it's like they got a fucking They're not NFL fucking cap. cheating. Uh, how many times can I tell can I tell you this? They're doing what is allowed. Be mad at the league for having it be able to happen. They are not cheating. They are nope. taking advantage of a system. They're doing what the New England Patriots say. So if you say the Patriots cheat, you're clowns as well. They're working around a system and they're able to win without their best player in the lineup the whole regular season. All right, he comes back. Yeah, now you have Tyler Johnson making what like four or five million on the fourth line. Well, their fourth line's amazing, and they were able to sneak around the cap by doing what. Any other team would do if they were capable of it. That's why Iserman left. His, he has integrity. Yeah, exactly. He, was, he saw what was coming. Biz, you're just trolling this episode. You're a fucking Canadian's troll, and I don't appreciate it because your team's trash, and you're going to lose to Vegas or Colorado, and then who are you going to hop on? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I haven't given any thought. <laughs> But I haven't gone that far. I sent you guys a text the other day. They're like, Tampa's, I mean, they're like the model franchise, though, when it comes to drafting, having patience. I mean, do you remember when Hedman early struggles in his career? And I don't think they were coming close to trading, but there was some scuttlebutt that they, yeah, that they, they were might. Yeah, they never trading. No, never. They but, gave them time. But they had, they let these they let their guys develop in Syracuse. They they bring them along slowly, and then they have to have the transition from Stevie White to Breeze By. Breeze By, I know that's what they used to call him when he played in Mont- uh, Montreal. I know it's Breeze Bois. But, like, it's been seamless, and this team has been a contender for a decade now. I don't think I that's think the Breezebois who played. I think, uh, I think all uh, Julian the— Julian Breezebois? Breezebois? No, I thought is it that, was. Is the GM of Tampa the guy who played? No clue. I'm not, I, don't, I'm, I, don't I don't know anything. Uh, about that was, are we going to do this again? That was Patrice Breezebois, wasn't it? That might be amazing. Maybe, all right, that, all right, all right, and going back to where all the development Jeez. started, I think they were in Norfolk when they started developing all these guys, and they ended up. Uh, I think they set like an AHL record where they didn't win for like, or they didn't lose for like forty straight games. And Tyler Johnson was there. They ended up going on to win the Calder, Calder Cup. So great, great development. And uh, and and just going back quickly to Kalorn, like. Cool. We, we we talk about all these you know all these superstars on this team of course Stammer Kucherov but it just seems like last year it was Palat the guy to step up and kind of play out of his mind and now you got big shoulder pad Kalorn who who who's ripping it up with uh, with uh, what's his name with Braden Point 
And, yeah, and and I talked about um, I, I on Twitter. I mentioned that Braden Point he was 79th overall in 2015, and then in 2016, I think they got Sorelli like six 75th overall. So you talk about the drafting, and then I mentioned in um, in the 2015 draft, Braden Point I think is the second best player now. Uh, Leon Draitzel, I would say, is head and shoulders, That's right? Fair. And then people argued and got very upset that that I said that Point is better than Pasternak. 100% come and argue with me. I'd love to have a beer, and you can talk and look at numbers. And people, Pasternak, his, his goal scoring. I'm sorry, man. I look at fucking Braden Point, overall hockey player. I would rather have him. I love Pasta. He's an absolute game breaker. But this kid is at a different level, and he plays so good defensively. And then you want to talk about, oh, he plays with Kucherov? Look at who Pasta plays with. So don't talk about being on a line, making the player. It's a guy who's a nonstop motor. He makes that team go. I'll tell you right now, you watch Tampa Bay play. Who, who Now, Vasilevsky being their goalie who shuts it all down. He's their most important player. After that, Patty Maroon. Fuck Maroon. What a game he had in game five to close it out. That line, that line with this Ross Colton kid who flies around with Tyler Johnson, and then they got Maroon down low. He is so good at protecting the puck. And that line had about 40 chances to score. And then Colton finally buried the second goal uh, to make it 2 nothing. that pretty much put the game away. But that being their fourth line is wild. That's got to really irritate other fan bases when like they insert like the one guy who's not a household name in the lineup, and then he gets He's been the awesome. He gets the American kid, too, from Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, he, and then he gets the, 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 what do you call that, the the insurance goal? Oh, yeah, he gets the second goal in a clinching game. Mm-hmm. Um, and Islanders fans, you lost in six last year, and it was in overtime. So I think there is like a lot of confidence for Islanders players and fans in terms of going to this series. Basically, as much confidence as you could have going playing a wagon like Tampa. But they didn't have Stamkos and Point missed two games. So you... you <laughs> Islanders, you have you're well, not uh, here's here's you, you're, you're not playing the same team, and you don't have Anders Lee. Which, by the way, I do need to mention the Islanders are doing this without their leader and one of their best forwards. Very impressive. But you were going into the Lions Den in Tampa, and good luck. You're going to need it, but you're not playing against the same team that you played well, against last year. Well, I disagree with you, and even Josh, what, about what going going to Cooper's comments after the last two rounds and play the clip right now, Grinnell. Okay, you know I've been very fortunate. Um, coach in a few playoffs now and those are two of the toughest rounds we've ever faced and uh it, it's it, it was uh it was a hell of a grind to get out of this division so he said he said you know after those first two rounds he goes as long as they've been there those have been some of the hardest they've had to battle through we know florida was a war and even though this one was five Every game was competitive, chances at both ends, and it took a lot out of them. So I actually think advantage Islanders, given the fact that they steamrolled Boston, and they playing that playoff-type hockey, I think that they're going to be able to shut them down. And I, in fact, like their depth even a little bit more. What the fuck are you talking about, dude? What are you talking You like the Islanders' depth better than the Tampa Bay Lightning? Are we fucking doing this right now? Sezik- All right, let me what? tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Sezikis, Martin, and Wellen's own Cal Clutterbuck. Yes, I do like their depth a little bit better. Oh, okay, okay, Biz. All right, all right. So so let's say this. Adam Pellick is a fucking stud. We've talked about him. And him and Pulak did a great job playing against Bergeron's line. Yep. And, th- and they're going to have to do it against Kucherov and Point. Do Let- you think Letty and Mayfield are going to have a better time or an easier time playing against Steven Stamkos, Alex, and fucking Alex Kalorn than Krejci and Hall? It won't matter. And they're going to be patrolling okay, and then do you the think, offensive do you, blue line. Do you think, Andy Green, do you think Andy Green and Dobson, and Dobson's a nice young player, but there was some third periods he didn't see the ice. Do you think it's going to be easy for them? Do you think it's going to be easy for them to go against Gord, Goudreau, and Coleman? Probably the best third line in the NHL the last two seasons. Never heard no, of No, the depth issue right now and the, the, the fucking mentality you have that the Islanders have more depth than Tampa is top three dumbest things he said in the history of the podcast. And we both have a million dumb things. That right there, is, put it on a fucking clip. That's the, one of the dumbest things I've ever heard him now, say. Now I know exactly why Islanders and all these other fan bases hate your There's guts. six fan bases who hate me. That means there's 25 once uh, – no, no. We got 32 teams now. I think yeah. so. There's there's 26 team fan base who still love me, despite the fact that they have two big players playing in this series that they didn't have last year. Who was it? Was Stamkos and who was the other one? Point missed two games out of the six, and, and, and Point ended up missing two games. I like Islanders' chances way more this year than than last year. I think he's on meth. Okay. 
Um, two episodes in a row, you put it up my hoop wit. I got my French speaking names mixed up. It was Patrice Breeze by Breeze. The lowering the mound one was great though because yeah. you were like talking shit. Yeah. I'm well, like, all right, all right. well, that mean that, I was making that that wrong joke for twenty years. No one called me out on it. So Sean, yeah. our, our our new videographer, he ended up coming in with the answer. He he was well aware. Well, he's of- a baseball stud, so he knows. He goes, they fucking yeah. lower that. Yeah. And and everyone, it's great. Everyone like who who listens to the show heard me argue, and then they run to Twitter and like tell me. I'm like, yeah, keep listening to the show. I I, I apologize to what halfway through. Uh, you actually yeah. came over. And Sat next to me yeah, just I to did. Apologize. I did. I had. I had. A Thanks, gro- I had a grovel before you, but Biz will be apologizing once Tampa wins in five or six. Uh, we got to mention one other thing. We've been talking about Palat last year. Well, Palat made his presence known the other day with a flyby chicken wing on Brett Pesci's melon. Now I know it wasn't the highest speed one, and, and Pesci was fine, but. I was surprised he didn't even get a fine after that. Like, those are the type of hits we I talk about. Get it. The league is trying to get rid of. They're trying to eradicate him. That's a guy going out of his way to hit a guy in the head with a fucking arm, shoulder, elbow, whatever. He lifted his arm up to hit him. He doesn't even get a fucking fine. I, I have no problem with Palat as a, as a person, but how does he not get a fine? Especially we go back to the Shifley. He gets four playoff games for, for checking a guy point three seconds after after he had, had the puck. Was it already mentioned that you ended up sending a tweet? You said that's way dirtier than what Shifley yeah. did. Uh, no, we didn't say that, but it was. It was. Palat made it clear that he was blatantly going for the guy's face. And he put a shoulder right into his face. And people, you know, you know go bananas on me on Twitter. It's a, it's a day that ends in Y, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> Shifley fucking skated the whole length of the ice. Well, yeah, he was trying to stop an empty netter. We, I said it was charging. But if you're going to talk about actual act of, like, trying to injure somebody... Fucking Palat did it way more than Shifley did. Shifley was trying to save a goal. Palat just blatantly shouldering a guy in the face. He got two minutes for it. I was shocked, R.A. I thought after the game he might get suspended. No. Yeah, so. not even a fine. I mean, like, Richie got five, five days fine. It's it confusing. is. It is very, very, very confusing. But And I love George Peros, and I don't fucking yeah. resent. I, I'm not jealous of having that job. That might be one of the toughest jobs in the world, but that one made no sense to me. Yeah, it's just the, like they say, the only consistency is the inconsistency. Great job, R.A. Great job. Uh, Carolina, um, you know, did they make progress this year? I know they had designs on a Stanley Cup run. I thought their goaltender let them down collectively. Uh, again, Nadelkovich was fine the last game, but he, he let up that dud in game one when it looked like overtime was coming. Then they go to Mrazek. Mrazek has that disaster of a game uh, where they had eight goals in the, in the second period there. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if they're going to get by Tampa Bay no matter what, but I don't know. Did they take a step back? I, I think I think they got their core locked up. And yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Other, no, other, they got the, a lot of free agents. Well, they well they got Martinuk, who I believe is a free agent, yep. who's who I think is a, a leader in that locker room and a good depth player. Uh, Dougie Hamilton. That's, that's a big one. That's, yep. Yeah, that's a. But other than that, they got Shvetchnikov as a, a RFA. RFA. They got Aho. They got Teravine. They got the they got the big pieces locked in. So in that regard, I mean, yeah, is it is it easy to go out and fill the guys around them? Well, maybe not on your typical year, but given a lot of teams are up against the cap and, and you know we're in a in a bit of an odd time and there is expansion, can they fill those roles with other guys around them where they can make that next step? And and RA, I agree with you. The 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 biggest one in my opinion, hundred percent has got to be goaltending. And that's the thing when you look at where Carolina to is the and, and did they... <laughs> <laughs> go on. He likes golf. Close to North Carolina, All right. Tobacco Road's got some golf courses. You look at Tampa Bay and you ask if Carolina has has a step back. Well, if you want to compare yourself to a Cup champion and and and, and an all time great team, and, and that is Tampa Bay right now, you're missing the high end talent on the blue line in Victor Hedman. I love Jacob Slavin. I love Dougie Hamilton. Neither one of them are Victor Hedman. Now that's not a crazy thing to say. He's one of the best defensemen in the world. So you're missing that high end talent on the back end. I love Sebastian Ajo. Tara Vinan's a really nice player. Svechnikov will continue to improve. You don't have a Kucherov. And I'll say you don't even have a point. Maybe Ajo, if he's playing on Tampa Bay, could be legitimately like better and look like point does, but you don't have the top end talent on the front. And then the biggest issue of all is you don't have the goaltender. So when you want to talk about like what do we need to do, if I'm looking at Carolina's team, what do we need to do to become a Stanley Cup champion? You need the superstars. And you've seen with the Blackhawks and the Penguins and the Kings, you have those superstars in the key positions that Carolina doesn't have. And the biggest one's goaltending. So where do you go out and figure that out? I don't know. But right now, that's what you're missing, that high-end talent that's able to put you over the top. Fair. 
smartest thing you've said all podcast. I've now, been fucking I, rolling I, through this I, podcast. I, I don't even. You're I, like a Canadian Jets I, I Canucks fan. I don't think we've mentioned the biggest uh, the biggest piece of that organization, Brindamore. And what's he's gonna, not signed. Yeah, I don't think he's signed either. So you kind of go to the Barry Trotz talk and, 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 you know, what he can do as a head coach with the players that he has and how he's able to galvanize the group and, and you know, get him to play under the system. Well, that to me is, is the main piece, because if you lose him, I feel like you lose your entire team identity. And as crazy as that sounds as a coach, you know, because oftentimes we say, you know, is what, you know, there's only so much coaches can do. It's about the players. This kind of has a little bit of a different feel to it, and I feel like they beat to his drum. Not signing Brindamo would be like hitting the reset button for that franchise, I think. Well, and they could have already signed him. All he wants is the entire staff, including his coaching staff, trainers, equipment managers, to all be re-signed, and they still haven't given him that. I mean, many people have said, like, give this guy whatever the fuck he wants. Because not only, not only are you going to continue to have a culture that's on the rise— you're not even going to have to pay Brindamore what he'd get on the open market. I don't even think he's looking for one of those $5 million, $6 million a year coaching jobs that are now being given out to the elite. So crazy talk to not even consider doing whatever Rod Brindamore says to get him back. I think I think they're just being weary that he doesn't get all his people signed. Then he bounces off to Seattle to go meet up with his boy, Ronnie Francis. <laughs> Imagine he gets them all three-year deals and he's like, I'll sign last. Yeah. Yeah, sign. His office is cleaned out, but he left one cracking sign in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, they don't even have a goalie signed for next year yet. Uh, Reimer and Mrazek both are uh, UFAs. Uh, Nadelkovic is an RFA. He's not signed yet. He made 737 k last year. Probably be looking for a bump. And he seems like to be a big part of their future, uh, but I don't know if they're going to bring in another I'm just gonna. Well. I'm just going to remind everyone going to this series, and this is no shot at all against Andy Green. What a career he's had. An older player who's grinded his way for fucking 16 years, I think he's been in the league. The third pairing of the Islanders is Andy Green and Noah Dobson. The third pair of the fucking Tampa Bay Lightning is Sergachev and Savard. There you go. <laughs> wow, so yeah. Savard's been in and out of the lineup. They've been it's been him. No, he was hurt and now he's back oh, in and he's was, playing he great. Hurt? I thought him and Cernak were switching it up. No, thought- Cernak's still in. Cernak's playing okay. with McDonough. How's that fucking second pair, Biz? Okay. Yeah. Good call good call with the depth talk. <laughs> and I also to a Carolina, Dougie Hamilton. That's that's a that'll be a huge hole if he leaves. He made five point seven five last year. I mean, he's probably going to be looking for a raise. Oh, he, <laughs> fuck yeah, that guy's an offensive wizard. And I think that with what happened in Boston and Calgary, and you remember the 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 talk about how he was like pissed his brother got sent down with Calgary, and finally he really has found his way in Carolina. I'm sure a lot of it has to do with Brindamore, and a lot of it has to do with him getting older and more mature as a player. You cannot lose him if you're looking to continue to build this thing. Yep, absolutely. Maybe the Islanders can pick him up because you said they need to work on their depth. Well, not you, though. They got the best depth in the world. All right, boys. The Internet has connected us with the latest news, long-distance friends, and funny animal videos. Unfortunately, it also connected us with the hackers and cyber criminals. Aura protects you from the worst of the Internet so you can still enjoy the best of it. Aura provides digital security protection to keep your online finances, personal information, and tech safe from online threats. It's all-in-one protection from identity theft, financial fraud, malware, scam sites, and so much more. With Aura, you'll get alerted to fraud and threats fast, like if your online accounts or passwords were leaked online, or if someone tries to open a bank account in your name. Aura is easy to set up. All plans come with $1 million in identity theft insurance to help recover your stolen funds and experienced U.S.-based customer support that's got your back. With an easy online dashboard and alerts sent straight to your phone, Aura keeps you in control and guides you through solving any issues. For a limited time, Aura is offering our listeners up to 40% off plans when you visit Aura.com slash chicklets. Go to Aura.com slash chicklets to get complete protection and savings of up to 40%. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash chicklets. C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S. All right, gang, we're going to bring on Colin Blackwell right now. Like we said, we talked to him a couple weeks back while he was over in Riga, Latvia. But uh, he's got a hell of a journey to the league, and it's good stuff. So without further ado, Colin Blackwell, what do you got, Biz? Well, I think, uh, Grinnell, you ended up growing up with him. You said he was a pretty good lacrosse player as well, right? Oh, unbelievable. I think they won a state championship their senior year. I think he could have went and played at Harvard for lacrosse as well. Okay, so he's, so he's a five-star athlete. Five-star athlete. And I tell you what, great story and a lot of resilience and adversity battled through. And congratulations to him on a great year and a bronze medal at the World Championships. Yep. All right. Let's kick it over to Colin Blackwell. 
It's time to bring our next guest on the show. And it's been a while since we had a fellow Massachusetts guy on with. This guy played at Harvard before turning pro. He just finished his fifth season and his third in the NHL, where he posted career highs in goals, assists, and points for the New York Rangers. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Colin Blackwell, how's it going, man? Not too bad, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. Uh, congrats, dude. Playing over for Team USA in Latvia for the World Championships. Your first time representing your country? Yeah, it's it's pretty unreal. I uh, The only time I really got a chance to, obviously, did those uh, festivals growing up. Yeah. Um, and then did the pre-World Junior Tournament thing. Um, so for me, to kind of get a chance to, to do something like this overseas, wear that, uh, that jersey, it's pretty special. Yeah, for people who don't know, when the... COVID hit, we started doing some online video game, and you came on. You were an awesome guy to just kind of shoot the shit with when we were playing video games. We said we'd have to have him back on, and then who knew the season you'd have this year. It's really cool to see what happened in New York for you, just kind of getting a chance to play a role you'd never had, had, had the opportunity to before. Yeah, I think when I played uh, NHL with you guys, I had to scratch myself, uh, or I had to scratch somebody else in order to get myself in that game. So yeah. You called uh, yourself up, dude, from the minors, I think. <laughs> yeah, I did, and then ended up getting hurt like a minute into the game, so that went well. But, uh, um, yeah, like it's just kind of one of those things. Everything kind of went so uh, – it was a wild year, and I uh, finally got a chance to play, and I was always really looking for and yep. ended up working out for me, so it ended up being a great fit. When's the first game? Who are you playing? Uh, so I guess right now we're Thursday. So Friday we got one more ge- uh, one more practice, and then we play Finland in the first game. Quick back to back with Finland and Canada. So jump right into it. A yep. uh, couple practices before uh, we kind of get the ball rolling. So looking forward to it. And it's uh, the rink is sick. Everything's pretty sick out here. So it's pretty exciting. I mean, just even going back to the last couple of years, like I don't want to say you didn't have stability, but obviously not given the ice time. And then even going back before that, bouncing around the American League, what was it about coming into this year and finally settling yourself in as a a full-time NHL hockey player? Yeah, I think I've had two different times in my career where I kind of really needed to, you know, make the jump or make the step. Like I think going into my second year in the AHL too, I was like, all right, either I'm going to be a full-time fourth line player in the AHL and also uh, maybe borderline coast player. And I kind of needed to just change my mindset a little bit. I think when I played in Rochester after jumping over from um, San Jose, I finally just, you know, was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to play hockey and kind of do my thing. And I think just being able a little bit looser and stuff like that. And then I kind of took that mindset into this year. I mean, I was turning 28 years old. Um, I've got a little bit of a taste of it going into the year. I think I played, what, 33 games beforehand, and I was basically saying, you know, this is my last chance, and you don't know how many chances you might uh, you might get in this. And, you know, the league's getting so much younger. And, uh, you know, this year, too, we had so many young guys on the team, and um, I was kind of one of the older guys, even though I didn't have too much experience. So, for me, it was a little bit of a mindset, just kind of, you know, saying, hey, this is my last chance. Yeah. Let's, let, let's take a run at it, because if I don't crack it this year, then – you know, you know, some teams are going to move on for me. So um, you combine that with getting a little bit more playing time and having a little bit longer leash, uh, you know, good things can happen when you get a lot of confidence. And that's kind of what happened with me. I've kind of always been able to do it and jump up and down the lineup. And I was just kind of waiting for that shot. I think that's one thing guys don't understand or, you know, you get to the National Hockey League level and all of a sudden you're on the bottom two lines and your leash is this big. And if you make a mistake, you're playing not to make mistakes, basically. And that's probably what you were feeling when you were bouncing around even the American Hockey League at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I came into the AHL, I mean, a lot of people, I think, don't realize it or kind of get it. Like I was just saying, like, even though I never really played that situation in my life, like I remember playing against you. Uh, I played for the Barracuda and I was saying the last game that you had when you played in Ontario, like I was literally on the ice for that. um, When you fought um, Sortini, like I was a fourth line center in in the AHL. And I was like, I might not be happy with it, but at the same time, this is how I'm going to get noticed. And this is kind of how I'm going to, you know, get more ice time and just kind of go from there. And it's either you can go down to the coast and maybe put up a lot of points or, kind of accept your role and that ended up being the best thing for me because I think a lot of teams maybe saw you know I've always been more of an offensive minded guy my whole entire career and then I showed I could kind of play that bottom six kind of mindset and that kind of gave me a good kind of perspective of how I was going to you know play my game moving forward like you're not going to take guys who are on the first and second line uh, out of the lineup uh, when you're coming up from the minors they're just that good and that skilled so for me I knew I was going to start on the fourth line and kind of climb my way up from there. 
we, we love going back and, you know, to kids growing up and how they got into hockey. And I kind of want to hop quickly, though. You played at Harvard, and I think a lot of people don't know what guys go through in their career. And you yourself, I think you had to miss a whole year playing, right, because of a concussion? Yeah, two years, actually, a little Fuck. more than two. Like uh, That's amazing, kind of the man. Journey, journey's been long. And uh, so, like, even just coming back here, everything kind of coming full circle. The year that I had, uh, like – this year was special but just kind of going back to some of the beginning years that I had my freshman year at school I did pretty well and then going into my sophomore year I was hoping to do and expecting like big things and I ended up getting two concussions my sophomore year back to back and I think I played 50 percent of my sophomore year missed my whole junior year withdrew from school and then wow. pretty much missed 20 26 out of the first 28 games of my senior year um so then I end up coming back for playoffs that year um doing pretty well and all of a sudden kind of got the ball rolling again had that fifth year of eligibility and used it there um and kind of tried to climb the ladder to get my hockey career back on track pretty much that is amazing because to be where you're at now a great season with New York playing for Team USA I mean there was a time you probably wondered like am I ever going to play hockey again Oh, yeah. Like, I remember, uh, you know, uh, looking at internships and being like, what's the next thing? And like, one of the funny stories is I remember going to I was doing like consulting interviews and like financial interviews. And it was like a group interview with like on campus with a bunch of like five other really smart, like Harvard kids. And basically everybody went through why you should be the the person to get this internship. And I basically looked around the room and I was just like, <laughs> these, these guys answers are 50 times better than mine. Like you can take him over me. Like, come on now. Like I was like, I was looking like kind of hockey was in the rear view mirror. I started looking at a lot of different things, what Avenue I was going to go. And I mean, yeah, there's some pretty dark times where I was just ready to kind of hang them up and, and kind of see what the next step was kind of going from there. And definitely uh, I was lucky I was able to climb out of it, but uh, I was definitely uh, looking at some different things I could do. When you said there was two back to back, was it, was it for sure um, you came back a little too early from the first one or were you more stubborn? Like how did that all go about where you were already playing maybe too soon? Yeah, I think the first one like kind of messed me up a little bit just because, you know, I'd never had one of these before. So when I took the hit, I knew something, you know, I didn't feel 100% right, but I didn't think it was like bad enough to maybe sit out or something along those lines. So I ended up playing maybe a couple more games through it when I, I looking back shouldn't have. Yeah. And then going back to the second one, I mean, I was healthy enough to come back, came back, probably played, you know, a handful of games before I got the second one. But um, and then all of a sudden you kind of go through that whole dark hole, black hole of Brutal. like, you know, one hit, something along those lines, oh, uh, you know, f you don't feel right. And, you know, looking back, like, uh, I definitely had, you know, some battles, uh, you know, maybe I could have back come back like the second time, uh, or the, after the second one, a little bit quicker. Um, but it's just the mental head games that I kind of played with my head that, uh, a lot of people don't really think about like it's an invisible injury like I, I look good from the outside but uh you know I was dealing with some things and to kind of get over them and finally you know um you know break the hump and break the mold and kind of feel like myself again was you know it was two years so um it was pretty dark times but just to kind of go back and feel comfortable playing again that was like the biggest thing was was there anything in particular you had to do like go see any specialists I know. Yeah, so I, know I saw him. Crosby, I, I, Crosby I saw him all. Up going to see uh, uh, Jonathan Sigalette, I believe the guy's name is. Yeah, so I, I'll give him a little shout out. Like I, you know, for six months, kind of had um, was kind of taking it easy. And the next six months, my parents kind of got involved. And then the next six months after that, I was kind of researching different things, like Jesus. trying to go outside the outside the norm of seeing osteopaths and doing acupuncture and all that stuff. Just at that point in time, it wasn't really about playing hockey again it was just about feeling like myself again I ended up like withdrawing from school because you know I was feeling like shit and wasn't doing school wasn't being able to like party go out do anything like that drink too much and then I wasn't playing hockey so I was like what am I doing here I gotta start thinking about myself as opposed to you know think about getting back on the ice so one of my buddies on my team I was ready to hang him up and kind of give it up and basically he had said you know, I, I got a concussion and went down to the boys at TB12 in Foxborough, and I was back in, you know, uh, like a, two weeks or so. So I was like, you know what, why don't I, you know, go give it a try? And I went down there, and my guy down there, physical therapist Dave, uh, you know, he got me back in probably a week and a half, two weeks. It was all my neck. It was just so messed up. Wow. And, That's what Crosby uh, was did. It was giving me all, neck. Yeah, it was, it was all these, uh, you know, different muscles and stuff, and 
I ended up coming back and playing in the playoffs that year. And it wasn't until, you know, two years after all this stuff happened that obviously now anytime I, I, I go back and see him whenever I can. And uh, he's the man and basically, you know, saved my hockey career pretty much. Shout out Dave at TB12. I'm battling an elbow injury, not to make it about myself, but I randomly, no, I randomly got a text. Dave. I got a text from a buddy who said, hey, man, I, I had the same injury, and this guy Dave at TB12 helped me out, and then you just said it. So I, I, I wonder if it's yeah. him. It's Dave Mar- Dave Marison. He's, he's he's the best. Like, anytime I'm home, I uh, I try to go in and see him, so. Nice. So are you on on the diet now? You you a full blown cult member? <laughs> no, not 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 that big. I, I definitely uh, started eating healthier once I got there. Like that's kind of part of it. They they just some of the stuff you eat and everything along those lines. But no, I'm not that big. I think everything's good in moderation. And for me, it was really just like getting the right uh, right hands on, on some of the stuff that I had trouble with. And you know, he's the best. So I've gone to him for a couple different stuff uh, here and there. And yeah, he, he's the man. I actually saw him right before I came out here to, to Latvia, and uh, guys just gets it. Colin, was Havid a place you wanted to go as a little kid in grade school? Or did hockey put it on the map for you later? Yeah, I think, uh, honestly, growing up, I was a big UNH and Maine fan. Like, I remember the days when Maine was in the um, – yeah, the Frozen Four. I remember. I love their jerseys, both their jerseys. I just thought that rivalry was so sick. Like growing up in New England, and obviously BUBC, like Nathan Gerby was a guy my size. Um, I enjoyed watching him growing up. Um, and then for me, it was basically I went on all these tours in college and got to the point where Teddy Donato said to me, <laughs> and he almost jinxed me, but uh, you know, if you get hurt and never play hockey again you know, what kind of degree, what do you want type of thing. And I was like, you know, you just hit the nail right in the head right there. Like at the end of the day, like I want to play hockey afterwards, but if it doesn't work out, like uh, if I get a chance, if I get a chance to go here, that, that paper goes pretty far. So I was kind of like, it was a no brainer and it took me, man, I took that SAT so many damn times. Like <laughs> just trying, <laughs> just trying They're to like, get again, like, was, again, yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally it was an absolute grind, but it ended up working out and, um, you know, can't say enough good things about that and that program and just kind of how it started and how it finished for me. Like the way I came in when the program was kind of in the bottom and our class, I felt like did a really good job of kind of bringing it back and seeing where they are now and some of the guys that they get. Like um, it, it was definitely pretty special to be a part of. Did you fill out your league in classes with like all the nerds that are super snot? <laughs> oh, it was a funny story. My dad will probably kill me, but. Um, it was right after I got my first uh, conch. I all the a lot of the classes there are um, like participation based. You get a lot of points and stuff for going. So I had just gotten a concussion, and it was sophomore year where you have to like pick and choose your major, and they call it a concentration. And I chose government um, after hacking it through some math and econ. I, <laughs> I couldn't hack it, so I switched over. And um, so all of a sudden, there's this huge lecture hall, like three five hundred kids and it's a political science class and this is this world renowned professor and I'm sitting there in the front row because I had to go see the doc and the neuropsych guy afterwards and you know he said raise your hand for, uh, where are you guys just trying to from a political standpoint left wing to right wing we had like half the group say they were like right wing half the group say they're left wing so like I'm buzzing out the door afterwards didn't say a word didn't raise my hand and I, uh, he stops me and is like, oh, I didn't see you're the only one that didn't really raise your hand. You left wing or right wing. And I looked at the guy dead ass in the eyes and I'm like, no, I, I actually play center. <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> and government's his major. <laughs> and I walked out the door and I'm like halfway down to the rink. And I'm like, oh my God, like this guy either thinks I'm the biggest idiot of all time or he's like, damn, this guy is clever as hell. And I'm like, holy shit. Like I just told this guy to his face. Like I thought he was talking to hockey. (laughs) Oh my God. Let's hope he gave you a sympathy grade after that one. No, he did. No, I just like, I had like my, I, at the time I had my hockey stuff on and he saw me and I just thought he was like, Oh, what like position do you play? And I was like, no, man, I'm a natural center. Um, (laughs) Yeah, man. (laughs) Uh, Hold on, Ben. Sorry. You brought up your dad there. He might kill you for telling the story. And, I heard another classic one where apparently you scored, I think, a hat trick to win the state title in an unreal celebration with a cover on the Boston Globe, Boston Herald, but your old man wasn't thrilled. Is that true? Yeah, I think you heard that from uh, one of the boys. Like, I, uh, yeah, I think I did way too big of a celebration, and my dad grounded me at the time because I, <laughs> I think That's I old by like, 
Sully by the uh, the other team's bench, and he was the coach at the time. I remember he was so pissed at me, and uh, yeah, so you kind of learn the hard way that way. But uh, yeah, you win some, you lose some. But he, oh, I was just gonna say, so he was very strict growing up. <laughs> yeah, like not too bad. I mean, I think yeah, he was definitely pretty strict. Now, <laughs> now that you say it, just like hockey wise, like I mean, the way I look at it is like he invested so much time and money, like growing up, mass high school hockey, like then sending me to school and stuff like if you let the guy down like uh that's just how our bond like grew just through hockey going to the ranks and stuff like that so um definitely was pretty strict like i mean i feel like if you're a parent you're putting that much time and effort and you know money into your kid like you want them to put the best foot forward so like yeah he was definitely pretty strict and uh but he was definitely a huge role model for me like uh, hopefully I don't ground my kid. I hope he celebrates pretty well when he scores a goal. But uh, at the time, like, yeah, I totally get it. It was pretty hilarious. You guys, so over the top. Did you guys have a bit of a, a, an FU match when, when he tried to suspend you for a couple of weeks after celebrating? <laughs> yeah, we've definitely had a couple of those, but uh, he usually wins those. Well, another classic story Grinelli tells me is, and I mean, you're the best player in the state, but apparently you got uh, four goals in the first period against Grinelli's team and just walked off the ice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think he remembers. <laughs> I don't know about that one. I think we had like uh we definitely had a rule like our team like 93 Warriors growing up like we were stacked and um you know we there's two leagues in Mass we, there's the Metro and the Mass Select League and all a lot of the good players played in that Metro League and we didn't play against them uh we'd scrimmage them and and still do really well and I felt like uh, our team was pretty stacked. We always won a bunch of like state championships You guys and stuff won like it that, every but... single year, man. You guys would go to nationals every single year, but Wit was talking about Restucia preseason St. John's Prep versus Burlington High first period. It was you, Farrow and Sam Kirker. Kirker who went to be <laughs> you. You you guys ended up beating us like 8 yeah. to 8 to 3. You scored three goals in the first period and then you just skated after your third goal in the slot. You skated directly <laughs> off the ice. <laughs> and then came back on the bench in your street clothes, and you and Pharaoh are just chirping us the whole game. It was the cockiest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. That. It was a preseason game, and preseason, like, it's basically a tryout for all the guys. So our bench, like, you couldn't even stand on the bench because there's, like, 30, 30 40 guy, yeah. guys on there. Guys are, like, bleeding into the locker room. So then all of a sudden, we got our reps in. We scored. <laughs> we, we did our thing. And then I remember a coach looked at me, and he was just like, get the fuck off the ice <laughs> type of thing. So we went and showered, and yeah, it was like a coach for like the second half of the game. I remember that. <laughs> it's not often anymore that kids go right from Mass High School hockey and without a year go right into D1. So that freshman year, you had a good season. It was pretty easy for you. Had you even looked into playing junior for a year? It wasn't necessary. Yeah, I actually looked. I was looking at uh, playing for Junior Bruins or Junior Warriors and the EJ at the time, and then I talked about maybe going out to – to Dubuque for a year um, in the USHL and pretty much how it worked is that that was the plan. I was committed for a year after that. Um, and what ended up happening is a kid who ended up going to BC, he got waitlisted at the school and didn't get in. So the next day they were short a guy and I was the only really one I had done really well my senior year um, and like progressed a little bit faster than they thought. Um, and then on top of that, I had finished all my high school credits and done all that. Yeah. And, Basically, a lot of people were like, you don't have to go play juniors. And I ended up working out. I, I went right in. and um, But, yeah, I was definitely Big ended up jump. working out. But, yeah, it was definitely a huge jump. But, you know, when I was a freshman, we had a lot of good players come in, too. And then the senior on the team captain, he was, I think, the best player in college hockey that year was Alex Kalorn. And he just was so dominant. And I got a chance to play with him a lot. Um, and for a young guy go in all I literally I could have told you I had probably a couple of primary assists where I just passed to him in the D zone and the guy went coast to coast yeah, well, that was like, Wit's career yeah, yeah that was exactly. past his head. <laughs> so like it, it made my my life a little bit easier and then finally when you have a team that goes from I think coming in they were Harvard was one of the worst teams in the ECAC I think last place and then we finished second lost uh, in the championship that year that's when everything started turning around Colin, did you play, like, youth hockey for your town before, like, all the travel and elite teams at all? Yeah, I think, like, going up to Pee Wee's, I played for North Denver Youth Hockey. Um, and then it kind of switched over. I played for both for a little while. Like, I used to play Saturdays for your town, then, like, Sundays uh, for Valley Junior Warriors. So um, we kind of play all over the map. Um, so we look at – you leave Harvard. You're healthy now. You had been picked by the Sharks – what was the contract? Did you sign a, a, an AHL deal? Did you get an NHL deal? Because it was just one year with uh, the Barracuda. I'm wondering how you ended up in Rochester so quick and what the contract out of school looked like. 
Oh, it was not good. Pigeon I was, deal. I joke, I joke with my friends. I was eating. Cho- I was getting paid chocolate, uh, chocolate covered almonds back then. I, I basically, uh, yeah, I, I think I got paid league mi- one year AHL deal, league minimum forty five in the A. Um, it was kind of like, uh, I think I was one of their better prospects for a little while, and then all of a sudden I stopped playing. And yeah. um, I think it was kind of one of those things. My senior year, I, I did pretty well, but I still kind of had the injury bug, and I still wasn't one hundred percent quite myself. So. It was kind of a, you know, take what you can get for them. Yeah, they give me a contract, and you know, maybe I do well for them and turn out to be myself. And then, um, if not, like I wasn't really worth anything to them. And basically, we had, I think we had fourteen rookies on that team. That's like you talked about it, uh, Biz, in a in a different podcast. That San Jose Barracuda team was so stacked. There's so many guys that play in the NHL right now. And um, Timo I just, Meyer uh, I think, was down there, wasn't he? Yeah, Timo Meyer, Kevin LeBanc, Ryan Carpenter, Daniel Regan was the HL Player of the Year. On the back end, we had um, Joachim Ryan played in the NHL. Um, this guy just, Tim just did a great one, job but, of drafting and developing in San Jose. They've always d- done it oh, pretty I, well, and it's hard for for probably a guy not getting an entry level contract because at that point in time you'd been drafted by them. The time had gone up where they didn't sign you, and then they obviously yeah. gave you the opportunity because you'd, you'd recover from your injury. So at that point in time, it's like part of part of the financial investment plays a big factor into the development now, especially in the American League. Even when we came in, even if, as a rookie, if you were highly drafted, you get chances. Y- yeah, well, now especially they put you right in the power play where even more so back when I started that like you still had to ease your way into it. You weren't just handed everything. So, yeah, it's 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 a grind for sure. Yeah, so it was kind of like when I went to training camp, I saw one of my jerseys. I was, like, kind of being made for the Allen Americans, um, and I was like, oh, shit, like, that's, like, a big wake-up call. It's the East Coast. Like, maybe that's where they see me type of fit. And I, I had a pretty good training camp, and I remember, like, a lot of guys that – at Joe Pavelski there like he's had some really good things to say to me and I think for a young guy coming in like that goes a long way like probably has no idea who I am now but um like pulled me aside and just said he liked some of the stuff that I had and it just gave me a little bit more confidence like kind of going into that training camp and um I basically you know ended up going down to the Barracuda and our team was like pretty stacked and we were really good all year like I think we went on a 17 game heater and you know, I, I kind of saw my role was kill penalties and, you know, play on the fourth line and um, kind of go from there. And I didn't get that much playing time, but um, I had a really good playoffs, I thought, that year. And I thought going into the next summer that I'd have a job. And it ended up being, like, interesting. It was October pretty much, and I still, what? after the summer, just, yeah, didn't even have The a, worst a, feeling a in the world. Wait, so guys were and going was, to camp and you had nothing? Nothing. I, I, I ended up going to Buffalo's. And, it, and it's funny how it worked out. There was uh, uh, I ended up going to Buffalo's rookie tournament, and the only reason why I went was because one of my teammates at Harvard was a center, and he hurt his back like the day before. And I ended up they called me, be like, "Hey, we need a center for this rookie camp," and I was like, "This is perfect. Like, there's going to be a bunch of teams there, and I can showcase myself. And if I don't end up signing with you, then hey, whatever." Like, so I ended up going, and I ended up like kind of leading it and scoring, doing really well. Holy um, shit! I, I was one of the older guys there, but that's kind of why I was like, shit, this is like a hit or miss. Like if I, if I do poorly, I'm done I'm 20, 24 years old, like that's the last chance. So like a lot of pressure on me there going into that. And I did well. And they basically said, Hey, we want to invite you to Rochester's camp. And I basically said, Hey, I want to come and I want to be a part of this, but um, I kind of want to go knowing that if I go to this, then there's going to be maybe a potential to sign like an NHL contract for the rest of the year or something along those lines. So I ended up going, doing really well, and I ended up landing in a situation that, you know, really changed my hockey career in a sense that right when I got there, you know, you just talked about there's a lot of prospects and a lot of people that maybe a general manager that, um, you know, drafted them or signed them has a lot of affinity to, and it was all new management that came over from Pittsburgh. Um, So they had no basically affinity to any of the people in the pipeline, and it was basically a clean slate for everyone. So I kind of went in there, did my thing, got a PTO out of it, signed a 25 game PTO and then in my first like five games I, I did really well and they ended up signing me to a contract for kind of the rest of the year maybe after five ten games something like that so um and then I end up kind of playing on the third line killing penalties didn't play in the power play at all found my little role and um I end up like 
kind of leading that team and scoring. Um, it was just like a perfect fit for me. And like I was saying earlier, like confidence is kind of everything. It just kind of took off from there where I was like, that was the year where I was basically like, all right, I'm either going to be out of the league in a year and a half. I'm going to be working behind a desk or I need to kind of basically stop worrying about what other people think and kind of just play hockey. Like I've done my whole entire life. And, you know, I also then started gaining some confidence, trust from the coaching staff, other players. And it kind of went from there. And we also had a sick team. So like, if you played on the top three lines, you got to play with some really good players. So like I played with Alex Nylander who plays in Buffalo. I mean, uh, in Chicago now and Hudson Fashing uh, for majority of the year who plays really good AHL player right now has got some NHL experience too. So like that was our third line. And so the team was pretty stacked. That's wild that not only did you deal with a concussion and wondering if there was going to be a future, then you come back, actually have a good year in the AHL and stuck again. So it's so crazy to see how it could have ended. And then you play in Rochester, have that good year. Were they not, did they not want to resign you? How did that go down? No, they, they did. It was just interesting. Like, a lot of the things that went on were I really felt that they liked me and that they wanted me there. Um, but when we came in, there was eight, I think, NHL contracts that they had buried in the coast from the previous management. So it was like a contract thing where they wanted to wait, wait, wait. And I, I didn't really want to wait. And it was finally coming off that big year. And, um, you know, I, I, I already felt like I had kind of, you know, missed a lot in a sense of maybe getting an entry level contract out of college and, I'm seeing all these guys making four times as much as I am and I'm playing over them and stuff. And I was yeah. like, like, I'm sick of, it was kind of one of those things like, you know, you want to go where you, where you're wanted type of thing. And that's how I ended up in Nashville talking to Scotty nickel out there. Like I uh, ended up talking to him and, you know, he basically everything that he said is everything that I was kind of asking for, looking for that chance type of thing. And um, so that's how I ended up signing in Nashville for two years. And um you know, I know that the Buffalo wanted me. It was just along the lines of, you know, they had a lot of prospects there. They had a lot of things. And I was just really looking for where the best fit for me really was. It's it's, it's so interesting talking to you because I think people listening at home and just looking at, like, my career, it's like everyone thinks it's pretty easy. You know, you get drafted, you go to camp, you're in the NHL. Whereas 90% of the guys, they have routes like you. I mean, maybe not as crazy as yours, but it is such a grind. And so many players in the NHL like yourself had a time in their early 20s where they maybe thought, I'll never play in that league. It's it's just crazy to have to have that self-belief grinding through so many times when there's no answers for you. No, 100%. Like, I, I've said it to a bunch of people before. There's obviously a huge difference between the American League and the NHL, but there's so many good players and the minors that they just really haven't really gotten a chance yep. or they get called up and they put up a ton of points in the AHL, but they're buried on a fourth line and that's not really kind of their style of game or their role. So I kind of basically had to reinvent my game a little bit. And basically I was like, Hey, I, I grew up a Bruins fan. So I saw guys like even look at Marshawn and Lucic, like those are two guys that I could be wrong, but they didn't get called up and they play on the first line the first year that they were in Boston I remember Lucic was fighting people left and right and he was you know playing that fourth line role and then once he got that you know trust or whatever it was from staff management coaches then all of a sudden he got the next opportunity and the opportunity after that and I was like it's not going to be pretty but that's kind of how how I have to do it type of thing so those are the kind of the things that I started working on like in the summer and the off season and kind of changing my game a little bit and you know I ended up working out what led to your first call up from Nashville? Um, yeah, it was interesting. That first year in Nashville was, um, I thought that might have been, it was tough because <laughs> I played probably 40 games in Milwaukee and probably only six, I think, six or seven in Nashville that year. And I was one of the first one or last ones sent down uh, at training camp. Had a really good talk with. Laviolette um I really think that he liked me they liked me and then my first game I go down to the AHL and I pop on my shoulder miss two months Jesus come back Christ, play, come back, <laughs> yeah come back and I play 10 games finally getting into it after missing some time and then I the fluke thing I got another concussion missed two months and that's when I was like shit like during that time a lot of guys had um, you know, out for six to eight weeks. There were a lot of injuries that year. So I was like, man, if this is all about timing, I really missed out with a lot of the timing stuff. So finally I got healthy and started playing. And even though I missed a lot of time, scored some goals and, you know, I ended up getting called up and our coach down there, Carl Taylor, like he, he does a lot of like individual meetings and he called me into his office and I was like, oh, you got to be shitting me. Like 
uh, another one of these like i was coming off a weekend that i didn't think i played that well or whatever it was and then all the staff and management were in there and told me i got called up and that's awesome. definitely one of the the worst like uh the best like most rewarding times of my life like i remember running grabbing my phone calling my parents calling my dad yeah. and letting, letting them know and it was kind of cool too because um the assistant coaches uh at the time in nashville uh dan muse he recruited me to go to yale and i ended up going to harvard so it was 10 years later how everything kind of comes full circle and he's the one that called me like we had a lot of guys that year get called up and you know they didn't actually play in the game because you know somebody was a game time decision or something like that and he he called me up and was like hey like like you're playing so like you can tell your family to come stuff along those lines so it was pretty sick i had probably eight of my best buddies from growing up come my parents my brother um so i think i lost money playing in that game <laughs> because i paid for all these tickets and shit out there and i remember looking at the uh the invoice for all that and how much i actually like got paid and i was like holy <laughs> shit this isn't as great as it seems but <laughs> um it was unreal just to experience it and share it with those guys like people have stuck by me from day one and through all the stuff that i've gone through it was it was awesome who'd you uh get your first tuck against uh, um i got my first tuck against Corey crawford not a bad decent. one to have Chicago. decent not a bad yeah. one to have and and playing in the United Center, like I never really played there. That place is oh, an unreal yeah. place to play. Yeah, I get the goosebumps going for the anthem. I was going to shift it over to the Rangers because we got some stuff to talk about. What did you have before that, R.A.? Uh, no, we could do that. I was going to say real quick, how awesome is Nashville, especially coming from Milwaukee? Oh, unbelievable. I, uh, Milwaukee, that's actually where I spent a lot of time in the summer now. Like When I played there in Milwaukee, like honestly, one of the sneaky best yeah. cities I yeah. ever played in in the minors. And so much fun so much to do like it's a mini like i guess major city they got the bucks they got the brewers like it, it's awesome to live there and then when i lived there it was winter time like not great weather so in the summer it's on the lake like lake life like it's unbelievable so i end up dating a girl from there and uh i kind of live there in the off seasons now uh, uh a lot of the time but then going to nashville like when we had the shutdown like i was in nashville for like what is it six months where all I did was play golf like every single day, pretty much golf and work out. And then once rinks started to open up, um, Nashville is just, it's unbelievable. Like that's a sweet place to play. Like it's it, everything about that, the weather stuff to do. You got Broadway, like fans. Yeah. It's pretty, it was pretty special. So yeah, Biz, last October, you signed a two year deal here in New York. Where do you live down here, by the way? You live on the island? Honestly, this, yeah, this year I actually, uh, everybody but six guys kind of lived in the suburbs this year because we didn't really go into MSG when I got there, everything was shut down. So it was, you know, it, it didn't really make much sense for me. We were going into the practice facility in Westchester pretty much every single day. And even on off days, we had to uh, like test COVID tests every single day. So guys were driving 45 minutes into to test. So I just uh, ended up living uh, kind of in the suburbs um, next year. That's definitely not, not the plan now that everything's kind of opening up, but, um, definitely get a, didn't get a chance to experience it as much as I, I know how, how sick it is. The last week that I, I was there, I spent a little bit of time. Uh, weather was beautiful, and it almost seems like once everything got lifted, like uh, the whole city's like it was buzzing around. So you finally got that chance in Nashville, and were you almost like I'm not resigning here, or was it more like you just liked your, your opportunity and where the Rangers were headed? Yeah, I just like uh, I definitely I felt like. Um, you know, I felt like I was grateful for the opportunity in Nashville, but uh, I didn't know if it was like the greatest fit for me. They had just had a lot of guys. Yeah. And I, I didn't really know kind of towards the end of it where exactly I fit. Um, and I felt like I, I, I felt like I maybe could have, you know, made a difference or something along those lines and just kind of the way I play. But I was just looking for that right, right fit, right spot. And, you know, Nashville was a pretty veteran savvy team. And um, I think, you know, going to a spot where, you um, Overall, there might have been a little bit more opportunity for me kind of up and down the lineup. Like I signed a, as a center and I didn't play center at all the year, uh, the whole year. I ended up playing wing the whole entire year and I got to play, you know, first line, second line, third line, fourth line. Got on the power play a little bit towards the uh, second half of the season, played penalty kill. and That was really what I was looking for just to kind of show everybody what I have always felt like I was capable, capable of doing, what I showed for what I was able to do in the AHL for a little while and just yeah. really kind of get that chance. And, um, you know, talking to Chris Drury, like he's one of the guys I talked to when I signed there, I just felt like everything that he had said kind of, you know, fit my mold really well and, and what exactly they were looking for and, you know, how 
he saw my game, um, you know, fit into the Rangers lineup. And I think when you have somebody say that they want you and then give you specific examples as, as why they want you, I think that kind of goes a long way. It's not just somebody, you know, telling you what you want to hear because a lot of people in this business definitely do that. And uh, I just felt like he, he told it pretty straight, like where he saw me and yeah. how I was going to compete for a spot and kind of go from there. And that's really all I was asking for. I mean, there were just so, so many big expectations coming to the year for you guys. But, uh, you know, second half, you guys did pick it up. You guys played extremely well. I think you guys really turned around with that Philadelphia game, the one that got, I think you guys had, what, eight goals? With but, no coach, with, without the head coach, right? <laughs> Yeah, like the second half of the year, we finally like, we got off to a slow start. Like I, I mean, even for me, like even in the beginning, some of that distraction stuff. I actually got taxi squad in the beginning of the year, so I wasn't even like really there for it, to be honest with you. Um, so I didn't really know half the stuff that uh, that happened or whatever. So for me, I can't really speak to it. But um, I think our, you know our team as a whole, we just kind of got off to a slow start. Like I can look back to a handful of games in the first ten that we either lost in the last five minutes or in overtime, like games we probably should have won and we just kind of got off to a slow start a little snake bit and it wasn't until kind of you know right after that 10 games maybe 15 games in we started picking it up picking it up and our big guys started dominating type of stuff like you have Zibanejad, Panarin, Booch, Nevich, uh, Adam Fox the year that he had like was was insane like some of the stuff that guy pulls on the ice is just so smart so cerebral and once everybody started clicking like like you said there were a lot of expectations maybe coming in because how hot we got or how the hot the rangers got maybe the year before before COVID happened but um this year is just so interesting with all the COVID stuff we had a lot of guys uh miss training camp uh because they got COVID, or all of a sudden we'll have a game and somebody missed it because maybe a false positive or something along those lines so from a COVID perspective, like it was just an interesting year, like just having anxiety because I felt like I was one of the only guys uh, people had gotten in maybe the previous year over the summer or right before training camp. And if you look around the room, there weren't too many other people outside of myself and some others that um, hadn't gotten COVID yet. And, you know, if there's a breakout in the room or something along those lines, you know, you're probably going to get it. And it wasn't a matter of that. It was more like all of a sudden, this is a big year for me to basically make it or break it. And I was like, that means I got to take possibly three mo- three weeks to a month off, depending on how things go. Um, so with the protocols and stuff. So um, I think guys were pretty dialed in from that standpoint. And once we kind of got all that figured out, everybody was pretty healthy. Um, everybody was on the same page. Um, and, and we just started clicking and doing really well. The offenses started clicking and, it was just kind of no worries hockey. Colin, you were part of a pretty exciting moment a few weeks ago uh, here in Manhattan. Obviously, the Tom Wilson Panarin thing happened. The next day, a uh, team puts a statement out. GM gets fired. President gets fired. Next game, triple line brawl right off the hop. Were you expecting that? Did you know when you were going on the ice that that was going to happen? Did, was it talked about before, or did it just spontaneously combust? Yeah, it's actually funny. Uh, um, just the game in general, like, obviously – um, it's just kind of the unwritten rules of hockey. Like you guys know that, like you stick up for your teammates and Brad's a guy that we love. And, uh, we just felt like, you know, what happened was a little bit over the top and we kind of needed to respond. And, uh, that day and even in pregame skate, I, I wasn't even on that line. I was on the third line at the time and I didn't really know I was starting until like five minutes beforehand. So, um, I knew obviously, um, you know, we were going to respond and try to, you know, stick up for, for what happened. And, all of a sudden I heard my name call right beforehand and I was like, Oh shit. Like I, I got to strap up and like, uh, <laughs> something might happen right in the beginning. Get so the, get the Tabasco um, sauce on your knuckles, Vaseline yeah, on the face, cut the Jersey a little bit, a <laughs> couple smelling salts, all that. So, um, I, like, I, like I said, uh, I mean, we love that guy and everything he's done for us. And just to be able to, I was so proud of a lot of the guys and everybody that, that stepped up. I mean, for me, I mean, I went against like Carl Hagelin. I think I was like, Hey, we're, we're, we're going here and uh, you don't really have a choice. And uh, it was kind of like a, a friendly one of those. And um, it was kind of one of those things where, um, you know, I, I was so proud of some of the guys and just to be a part of it and everybody kind of sticking up for one another and kind of things like that. It's just, like I said, the unwritten rules of hockey, like a brotherhood. And when one of your boys goes down, you got to stick up for them. And I think he would have done the same for us too. What about Brett uh, in the locker room? I mean, he's so, so amazing on the ice, and he has so much energy with the leg kick celebration. In the room, is he loud? Is he quiet? Is he cracking jokes? What's his whole vibe away from the arena? Uh, he's awesome. Like, uh, he's one of the nicest guys I've, I've ever met. And 
he's honestly like so smart. Uh, he's, that was one thing that I just didn't really know about him or anything along those lines. Like he's so smart, super smart guy, super intellectual, uh, on the road. He's always playing chess, but he, he's a, he's Russian. Like he, he loves cracking jokes, making stuff. Like we always joke around, uh, how like, you know, the classic stuff, like maybe Malkin in, uh, in Pittsburgh, how he didn't know some of the guy's names. So we'd always <laughs> joke around and say how he didn't know my first name and stuff along those lines. Cause everybody calls me blackie and stuff, stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, he's, probably the best passer in the NHL and I got a chance to play with him a lot uh this year the way things kind of unfolded and like if I miss one of his passes like he'd always like smile at me and just kind of like give me <laughs> one of the head nods like shaking his head type of thing like and I'm so much better funny, than like, you <laughs> <laughs> no and then like finally like the first time all season I gave him a pass and he didn't bury and I just went up to him and just like shook my head. <laughs> <laughs> then you're in the minors again. <laughs> you're the yeah, fucking coast. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a great dude. He's always like playing jokes and like he he was also like one of the guys uh, when I first got there. Like it was tough this year because there's no like team building just because all the COVID stuff. When I first got there, we had to quarantine for seven to ten days or whatever it was, and everybody's wearing masks. I knew names, but I didn't know faces, so. He was one of the first guys in the locker room, introduced himself to me, like couldn't be more down to earth. And um, guy just loves hockey. Like he's, he's sick. It's, it's insane the way he sees the ice. Does uh, Zabinajad get the, the ox cord in the, in the locker room? I know he's a big DJ in the off season. Yeah. It's funny. Like I heard that too coming in. I've heard some of his music and stuff and um, he didn't really run the, the DJ stuff too, too, too much. Uh, it was couple other guys uh we had lemieux before he got traded and then um i think it was like truba um kind of some of the decor ha- had the ipad and we're running the ox cord but um yeah he, he he's the same way like we had a lot of quiet guys that were like really funny and like mika like he's got his dj stuff on the side and some of the stuff and talk about some of the most like down to earth uh humans like i've ever met they're just welcome you in with open arms nicest guys and and our leadership core was 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 really good this year was that scrap with Hagelin your first fight ever no I've had a few in the minors I've been more a punching bag uh in the minors but uh um I don't even know if you can barely call that a scrap that was more like a wrestling match than anything but uh yeah like I, I probably fought four times maybe in the AHL um most of the time it's because I uh, I play a little bit over the edge sometimes and i you know blow somebody up and then you have to kind of like answer the bell type of thing i remember fighting like uh joseph labate in the ahl and he fought like ryan reeves and some of these guys in the ahl oh boy like, why the fuck are you like fighting me six <laughs> four and i'm like literally i got my four quick punches in and then absolutely he went to town on me but uh yeah like i've never been a fighter and obviously i've had the head stuff in the past but i, I feel like that is kind of in the past and um it's just kind of one of those things like uh i know a lot of guys over the years have stood stood up for me so um when i see stuff that you know like you said it's kind of that that honor code uh your line mate guys you go to battle with every night um you always stick up for them and try to do what you can even though you're not really a heavyweight so i uh I, i've been good friends with quinny for a long time so i'm a big fan of him and i got two questions one being were you really surprised when he got fired and two almost maybe a little disappointed because you had a head coach that really finally trusted you and it's almost like fuck i kind of i was in with him you know and now you're almost restarting your your, your you know everything again next year yeah like i i'm used to that by now yeah. I, I feel like it's it's definitely tough but i feel like you know nothing's ever really been given to me so even this year, like I got a chance to play with those guys and be on that line. But every single day I'd come to the rank and check the board to see if I'd still be there. It was a tryout for me kind of every single day. So I got nothing but good things to say about Quinny. Like it's like I said, it was the first time I, I ever got a chance to, to play really. And um, he kind of gave me that chance and kind of get that confidence. So kind of same thing happened with me in Nashville, with Peter Laviolette, like um, he, uh, towards the end there, I was uh, there when, we ended up having a coaching change and towards the end uh, in Nashville too. Um, I remember I didn't even play a game in, in the third, uh, not a game, a shift in the third period, but I was snapping it in, in draws and Lavi with 30 seconds left in a game in Anaheim. We're up four, three, told me to go take this defensive zone face off. And I look back at him like, you gotta be kidding me. Like I haven't played in literally 60 minutes because I've been sitting on the bench. So like, um, you know, having coaches like that. And then he, you know, ended up, having a coaching change halfway through the year. Um, and it's just, you know, next man up kind of mentality for me. Like it, it, it sucks definitely because I finally got that trust with that, that coaching staff and finally got a chance to play. Um, but 
at the end of the day, like I feel like uh, I ended up, you know, it's my fifth year pro and it's been the same kind of almost every single year when I've made that change. So, um, you know, I, I definitely looking forward to seeing who, who comes in and stuff along those lines. But, you know, playing for Quinny was awesome for me. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity that he gave me. Well, dude, as a as a fellow mask guy, I'm you know, really proud of you and happy for you because I think people are going to listen to this, including kids, and like realize it, it, it isn't always easy at all. And like the way you've just continued to grind and find that you're getting a good chance. I'm happy for you, and, and we appreciate you coming on. I'm sure it's late over there in Riga. But the other thing that's great about you playing in the Worlds is I remember when I went to the KHL, and who knows, maybe you, you want to continue to play in Europe when your NHL career ends, but if you play in the World Championships, it guarantees you a sick job in Europe. It's so important over there. Like The fact that you represent your country in that, in that tournament will really open doors for you over in Europe someday if you do want to go over there, so congrats. No, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. I, I know playing on this big ice surface, I'm hoping it's uh, pretty good for a small guy like me. Yeah. And going back to just mass, like you said, we... I think we got like eight plus mass uh, guys that kind of were bred in mass uh, hockey here. Kevin Rooney, Rangers guy, Brian Boyle, a couple of younger guys. Like there, there's a whole crew of, yep, Shazo. Yeah, uh, we, we got a heck of a, we got uh, Ryan Donato too. I played with at school and his dad was my coach. So like there's an awesome group there and it just says a lot about mass hockey too. Uh, quickly, we'll let you go, but you got to tell Ryan Shea, his dad's a legend, Dan Shea, my buddy, this guy one time, Biz, unbelievable hockey player at BC back in the day. He, uh, we went down golfing. He had two beers on the ride down. I was driving. He had seven beers in the front nine and shot five under. Shazo's dad. He's a fucking <laughs> living legend. So tell Get him. the mechanics going. Tell, tell Ryan I said hi and, and good luck over there, man. Thanks for coming on. No, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Big thanks to Colin joining us uh, all the way from Riga, Latvia. And again, congrats on the bronze medal. Uh, we had a few Massachusetts boys over there. With, yep, Brian uh, Boyle was the captain who didn't play all season. He's looking yeah. to continue his career. Did a great job over there. And Canada ends up getting it done. But they had a chance playing Canada in the semis to maybe go and get a gold or silver. So yeah. good job, team. I think Kev- Kevin Ro- Rooney was over yep. there too, right? Yep. And uh, also Connor Gallon too. Ryan, Connor, Ryan, Ryan Shea. Shea. Yeah, we talked about it a bit last yeah. week, and, and and Team Canada winning it. There was a, a lot of great stories. Uh, Troy Stetcher, he he was yeah. uh, he what was a, a pass he made, what a play he made on the winner. Yeah, so yeah. it's uh, you know a lot, lot of a uh, lot of cool stories over there for a lot of guys who got a, a big smile to end the season. All right, boys. Well, sport clips stylists are experts in men and boys haircuts with specialized training and techniques. Cutting guys' hair can be harder than cutting women's hair. And when you go to Sport Clips versus a place that cuts women's hair, you're getting stylists who are specifically trained to cut guys' hair. Sport Clips are experts in understanding facial shape and hair texture and cutting to a guy's best advantage. Sport Clips' signature service is the MVP haircut experience. It's so much more than a haircut. You get the legendary hot steam towel on your face, the massaging shampoo that makes you melt into your seat. It's the ultimate in relaxation. You know, with 1,800 locations nationwide, a Sport Clips is closer than you think. So visit a Sport Clips near you for a haircut that exceeds the typical experience from start to finish. And speaking of start to finish, the Islanders Tampa, the schedule is not out yet. We'll uh, keep you posted on that. They obviously didn't play each other this year because of the way the divisions were set up. Tampa beat the Isles in six in last year's semis, as we mentioned. Uh, our predictions, well, they'll go out over the weekend once we get the schedule. What so- do you think? Um, Might as well give them now. Yeah, I guess. Um, fuck, man. I mean, I got. I'm, I have a financial stake in the island. This is funny enough now, but it's going to be tough to beat Tampa. I don't know how. I don't know how they're gonna. Uh, I don't think. Go ahead. Sorry. I'll go. Fuck. I'll go Isles in seven. Wow. <laughs> I, you, yeah. you know, I, he's got the seventeen to yeah. one on them winning the cup. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be easy. When I'm talking about the depth, I'm not trying to say this is going to be a fucking sweep. Well, I know I said five. Pedal. I said five. Look at back pedal, folks. There's no backpedal, Biz. There's no backpedal. I said five. I'm I'm backpedaling that. I was excited just because how stupid you've been this podcast. But it ain't going to be easy. But Tampa gets it done in six again. All right. What's yours? I already gave it. I also oh, yeah, oh, yeah, pay yeah, attention. Yeah, yeah, good job. I got good Tampa call. in six. I don't know, I'm just hoping for a good series either. It'll way. be a good series. Yeah, it should be. Uh, moving right along here, the hot finalists, they just got announced literally seconds ago. Uh, Nathan McKinnon, Austin Matthews, and Connor McDavid. And you know, one of you guys noted that it was different from the Ted Lindsay. Uh, Crosby was nominated for the Lindsay, which is voted by the players. And Nathan McKinnon uh, is here for the hot, which is nominated by the 
the writers. Any any comment on that? Uh, no, I mean it's it's not surprising. I think if it had been either one of them, you wouldn't really complain. I think that if you look at the players voting, there's so much respect for Crosby and the season he had with Malkin out for a lot of the year, and and you look at the players who all know how good Crosby is, and he gets a vote. I th- whereas I, the writers I think, are. I think that tells you what maybe the players thought of the North Division. Um, why McKinnon? McKinnon was the ad. Good call. McKinnon wasn't in on the on the players one. Was, keep talking though. No, but you but you said as far as was Crosby not involved in the one. Crosby was a part of, of the the, ten, uh, the ten, Ted Lindsay with players vote on MVP. He, they took out Crosby and added in McKinnon. So Matthews was a part of both. So nice call. Okay, oh, fuck her. I'll take my L. <laughs> the fuck are you laughing at, Grinelli? Spitting out the pink Whitney vodka on camera. Yeah, fuck oh, off, fuck Grinelli. You, Why Grinelli? are you spitting out our vodka? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, was poor, it was poured down my throat. I don't really have well, an I'll answer. Blame it on the poor guy. Open the throat out. Look at Dana Beers. Yeah, seriously. You know what? Maybe my comment tells you what I think of the North Division. Give it to Cosby. Oh, oh so take out Matthews from both of them? No. <laughs> okay, well, he's all over the place, folks. No. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think it, it's McKinnon's well deserved. If he was in the Ted Lindsay, I wouldn't have been surprised. If Crosby was in the heart, it, it yeah. does, they both had awesome seasons, and it, none of it matters because McDavid's winning both. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, exactly. And it is interesting, too, because none of these teams now, what we're getting to the semis, have played each other at all this year, which is. This is unusual. what's exciting. Yeah. This is what is going to be interesting. And in terms of game planning, it's difficult because you have not seen teams in quite a while. I mean,. Tampa and the Islanders are as close as you're going to get because they did deal with each other in the bubble. But the the Tampa Lightning did not have to deal with the Coliseum, which will be rocking again. That's another reason why I said <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you didn't even know until I just said it. Uh, we also got the Norris finalists, uh, New York Ranger Adam Fox, Tampa Bay's Victor Hedman, and Colorado's Kale McCaw were the three nominees. Uh, to the defense player who demonstrates throughout the season the greatest all-around ability in the position. Yeah, um, McCarr missed 10 games, so pretty impressive for him to get on that, missing, uh, I don't know, what, what, a fifth of the season? It was only, I think, the, what, the third time in uh, NHL history that a couple of... Two uh, college guys? Two college guys were nominated. Really? I forget what the other two were. I know Chelios was involved in Leech. one of them. But, uh, guys, I think Adam Fox is going to win the Norris Trophy. I think he's going to win it. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to be Hedman. Because based on based on his uh, his numbers compared to years past, when he's, it's not really close. He wasn't even he wasn't even as good defensively, I guess, compared to to prior years' numbers. I think Adam Fox is going to win it. Uh, you said Kale McCarr, who was not. I just don't think. I think if he had the full season yeah. and the whole sample size, I think that he probably wins it. But that can't that can't be held against Adam Fox. And I think that as the season progressed and as the season finished. He kept accelerating where you thought maybe there was going to be some dip off there. and He got and, better. And, and, and in an 82-game season, yeah, maybe it's different, but it wasn't. No. So I think uh, I think the Rangers got their guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see. I mean, because Hedman, like I mentioned before, he's already in that kind of – that stratosphere where once guys already win, I think some voters tend to automatically go yep. with those guys again, and it's harder for maybe if, – if Fox is more deserving this year, it might be tough for him to break through because yeah. writers tend to just go with guys who've already won, I think, sometimes. But we'll obviously see what happens. We already mentioned the CN Tower uh, is a traitor. And they're flashing the car, Canadians' colors. I still can't believe they're doing that. That's absolutely It's a brutal. tough look for Ontario. It's t- it's, I mean, they knocked their fucking team out, and now they're sucking them off out. with the tower. To be fair, it's called the Canadian National yeah, Tower. it's in Toronto. Fair. I'm just trying to play the uh, <laughs> devil's advocate on the other side of the argument. But it's, it's Well, just, it, it's trying to say, like, yeah, we're all behind the Canadians, whereas every I mean, fan base fucking does not want them to win in Canada, so it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's like It would be like the like the bridge in front of us with the Zakem Bunker Hill Bridge. Like It would be like if today or tonight no. they have blue and orange for the no. uh, like, lights in, on this thing tonight. That's and a bad because analogy. the Islanders just knocked them up. Well, it's, it's, actually, no, it's, no, actually, it's a bad analogy because right. he's saying it's the Canadian National Tower. That is I know a Boston it. Bridge. That's not a United. United States right, Bridge. It's, it's that's actually, just the name. Uh, of, that's the name of the tower. It's not Canada's tower, though. It's it's Toronto. It's a Toronto skyline thing. I don't. I don't think of that as Canada's that tower. That looks like it's actually. It's Manchester. Like, I didn't even know it was the name. I didn't know CN stood for Canadian National. That, looks, that uh, might not even be the case. No, it, it is the CN Tower, but I don't know. Is it a? 
That bridge, I, that bridge looks like it's Manchester Monarchs colors because we won the Calder <laughs> Cup 45 minutes north of here. So keep the fucking change, Massachusetts. <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> oh, fuck that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's named CN originally for it's a Canadian national. The railway company that built the tower. It's a fucking railroad company. Wow. Not even a fucking wow. Canadian national thing. So suck on that wet and suck on that biz. No, but, uh, R.A., that is still a brutal analogy. No, it's not. The they Bruins... didn't fucking just lose to, to to Montreal. They lost the other round. You're trying to say Boston would... To, uh, Toronto got knocked out by uh, Montreal. They're flying the colors. The Bruins just got knocked out by the Islanders. Blue and orange would be the same fucking thing. Like, I just, said, like I just said, it was a round earlier. It was not it, this round. It doesn't matter. That same, it does. He got knocked out. It's, a, it's about the team that knocked you out flying their colors. The next, the team that knocked you out. That's the analogy. Okay. The, the fucking Islanders you knocked win. out the Bruins. You win, you right. win, you win. You're right. You win. You got to you 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 give you one. Seriously, two out of three falls. Uh, Biz, Ray Shero joining the Minnesota Wild as a senior advisor. Uh, He's is a he... genius. He traded Witt for Kunitz. Uh, he also gave me $24 <laughs> million. I love him. I'll forever love him. And Minnesota's probably going to go on to win 15 Stanley Cups. <laughs> Uh, do you think this is kind of like some GMs? They they kind of get out of the GM game. They they step up in these, these sort of senior roles, and yeah. they have a hand, but they don't seem to have to. Yeah, do as why much wouldn't? Work. Why won't, Imagine having a guy like that with that experience in a room with Bill Guerin, just to because yep. hard decisions have to be made. You don't want necessarily yes men around all the time. You need to bounce hard decisions off people who are going to have you know think think with the other side of their brain. Kind of like when Witt thought that Tampa was going to roll over the Islanders, and then I bent him over in that argument. You need intelligence intelligent people in the room like Ray Shiro and myself because you might have a guy like Witt at the helm and who knows next thing you know you're fucking picking lotteries and of course him and Billy Guerin have a history together uh, yeah he brought in together. Billy Guerin yeah. the year he traded my ass he brings Billy G in they win the Stanley Cup their first against Detroit and I'm sure that at that time Ray Shiro knew what he was getting in terms of not only a player in Billy Guerin but the guy he was probably you could see right away he's a future GM a future uh staple in like making decisions to run a team, and now it all gets reversed, and he brings Ray Shero in to help him. So Biz is right for the first time ever, and I think he will be used greatly in terms of making decisions and realizing what you got to do in Minnesota to get them to that next level. Well said, well said. Uh, boys, while we were here, we had a little bit of partying in Boston, and thankfully we had uh, like no days wasted so oh that goodness. we could uh, bounce back. So They're we're... killing it too, Biz, yeah, aren't they? They're doing well. They got the hydration replenisher. I'm going to pull up the ad read right now. Biz, you go one paragraph, I'll go the next paragraph. Or we'll do this thing together. Tag team like you're back in Wilton's. I don't know. I think I can handle this one by myself. Okay, okay, okay. Here's the deal. We've been hammering drinks during the NHL playoffs, and the only reason we've survived is because of D. DHM Detox by No Days Wasted. I can't afford to feel like absolute ass the next day. So I've always got a couple packets of DHM Detox close by, which help me stay productive and feeling my best in the morning. It's your ultimate drinking buddy and is the vitamin for when you drink and celebrate. No more feeling like a bag of bricks the next day after boozing. You get liver support, antioxidants that fight inflammation and break down toxins with DHM Detox. Pair that with the Hydration Replenisher, absolute unbelievable beverage mix. I think it's got like the watermelon flavoring, packed with electrolytes and immune support, and you are feeling fresh the next morning, like daisies. Heard of them? Fresh like daisies. Time is the most valuable asset you have. Why waste another day? For just a few dollars per night, you can be prepared for all of life moments to team... Fuck. The team at Donate... Fuck off. The team at No Days Wasted is here to help. When I'm going to need you this next paragraph. All right, I'm coming in. Just for more help. <laughs> Bring get, in the lefty. And get back to going where you love after a night of drinks. If you're late to the party, here's how it works. You take two DHM detox capsules after your first few drinks, and it goes to work. Double up with another packet if you're having a big, big night. DHM Detox is part of our drinking routine, as well as thousands of Chicklets listeners. They're perfect for bachelor party and wedding season. That's firing up as we speak. So stay prepared and make the most out of every moment this summer. Check out their bundles for the best recovery experience and never miss a beat. So you can hit that 9 a.m. workout like RA does. You can hit your work meeting or whatever you got going the next day. Not a big deal. DHM Detox is a 100% risk-free purchase on your first box. So if you don't love it, they'll refund you. Easy decision. We're going to hit you guys with a promo code. Just have a, head over to nodayswasted.co 
and use the Biz20 promo code for 20% off. That's nodayswasted.co for no days wasted after drinking with Biz20. Not bad. Good stuff. Thanks for the help. You guys are like Afrin Seeker over there. You take this and you drink, and I promise you, you will feel better the next morning. It's a it's a no brainer. Get on it now. No days wasted. It's magic. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, G just wanted to re- have us remind you we're back on a normal schedule next week. Obviously, there's going to be fewer games going to the semis. Yep. So Tuesday. We'll the, see you on Tuesday. Yeah. This. We're not, yeah. We got a couple more things here, but yeah, I just want to let you know we'll be back. Today's a bonus episode. We'll be back Tuesday with our next episode. Uh, the CN Tower. You ever have you ever gone on the top of that? Oh yeah. Have you been? Where? Uh, no. Yeah, they have. I went to Wonderland in Toronto though. Remember that amusement park? Yeah. Yeah, my dad told us we were going to a museum one time. He's like, we're going to a museum. We went up for a hockey tournament. Whole family went, drove up. And when we got there, we're going to a museum. I was like, are you fucking kidding me right now? But you could never say that in the car. But my brothers are younger. Museum? And he wheeled the old shagging wagon into fucking Wonderland. It was an absolute day for the ages. You got to play pranks on the kids. When you're doing something nice for them, tell them that you're doing something miserable just to fire them up even more. They Shout got, out Wonderland. They got the um, the, the see through glass at the top. Do you get scared by that? Oh, I'm a, not a heights guy. Yeah, I'm not a heights guy. I, I'm not, but I'll I'll do shit like that. Like, but I never have been able to overcome my fear of it. I mean, I've gone bungee jumping a handful of times, and I still like if I watch a Russian YouTube video, of those crazy kids like climbing old cranes, I get like sweaty palms and start getting like weak. Oh yeah. So once you it. get to the top, the you're looking what down through the. Yeah, the ju- building. Yeah, like at the top of the needle, you can like you know obviously the the the, ba- <laughs> the base of it is very thin, right? So you yeah you can like stand over it and look, look all the way down. Yeah, you could you could also eat up there, and I believe that it rotates. Yeah, they serve poutine up there. Yeah, now. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, Kalinda Ben. Yeah, there's a a, a a memorial to all the, like railroad workers there too, because it was built on the site of former rail rail yeah. yards. There's like all it's like a multi fucking part thing of uh, all like multi part like, I'm trying to think of the proper word but yeah it's it's a it's a huge memorial but it's all like it's not like one little like bronze statue it's a bunch of yeah this like, is RA's master things. class on engineering just to <laughs> hang tight here for yeah, the next hour yeah. um, just put that bolt there and then get the screwdriver over there and it's done it's built um, I was going to say, you, you mentioned the, the, those kids that do that for clout, where they go and they climb these oh types God, of buildings. Dude, I haven't have, seen this. Well, they, oh. they'll, they'll post a video of them off of like the end of the CN Tower where they're like hanging on by one hand. What? Yeah. They're Jeff just, Donnie does that kind of stuff. It's crazy. Wait, but how do you, there's no, there's no, there's no, like. What do you mean? Like the CN Tower's got to have a huge wall, right? Right. So I was using that as an example. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're, but but ultimately, the places that these guys are going, they're 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 trespassing. Yeah, they're, they're these, all these crazy abandoned buildings in Russia that they could just. I will say though, when I watch the videos, it gives me that feeling in my stomach that, that I, I you know you, oh, don't, you don't even want to watch. Nauseous, it. dude. Like legit, start sweating. Like your palms start get sweat. When you said Wonderland, wait, I think you're talking about the dog track down Rivera. I got a little excited. All right, <laughs> all right. Would you ever put on one of those squirrel suits and and, and jump? down have you no, ever he seen- only puts those on when he has his furby <laughs> nights with his wife <laughs> but, hey, hey, furby <laughs> what is it called furby what is it called you're taking furries but he's furby, like furby. <laughs> yeah me and my wife bust out we we put a furby out and we let a furby watch us <laughs> the only time i ever think the only time i ever the, what i think of is when you talk about the suits is a uh, turtle just pounding that girl out in entourage with yeah. like the suit on that the was an all, all time scene Oh, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about as far as those squirrel suits, though? These guys, these oh, like, oh yeah, like the, ba- the yeah. base jumping, like the yes. flying squirrel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that is that is even crazy. Cra- yeah, so they do not have. Um, no, they have a parachute, but oh, they they, do. they okay. jump. They basically base jump from a crazy height. They fly through the air like that, and then uh, eventually they pull the chute. That's fucking. You got to. That's dead. Oh, one one like quick stunt mistake, man. and you're yeah. Done. And I'm you're pretty done. sure they try to stay like close to the cliff they're yes. jumping off yeah, of. They'll, too. Yeah. they'll try to get ten feet above like rocks while they're. It's one they're... of those things where like I, I don't know if respect's the right word, but good for you. It's like you, you're 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 finding something to really like make you happy and make you feel alive. But like if you were to die that way, I don't feel bad. Yeah, you're pushing the limits of you know. You know, it's, ca- it's kind of it's I, I I would say the most extreme case of all that would be that documentary that came out on that guy who ended up climbing. Uh, Oh my God! The free, free, the free climb! Holy shit! Oh, what yeah. a documentary Alex that Arnold, is! Yeah. That guy was so strong. S- somebody, somebody said apparently that he was he was nervous about doing it the first time, and he didn't 
he didn't want to fail it while being recorded. So he actually had climbed it before they recorded him doing it for the first time, quote unquote. That was a ridiculous talk. So, it's free solo. Yeah, free solo. What a, Al, what Al a movie. Honnold, Check yeah. that. That kid I, is tapped. I think it's on Hulu. And you could tell he had a girlfriend, but he's like wants nothing to do with her because I think he knows he's so close at any moment to dying. It's just bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that, that's pretty much the re- main yeah. reason. He doesn't I mean, want to get too attached to someone yeah. or maybe have not someone become so attached to him because it, yeah, he, he he's living, He has to be in a different mindset to be doing that. He has to get his next fix. He's probably thinking, what's the next thing I have to do with no harness? You have to like not care about living to do that yep. i mean like to willing to die just to climb a fucking rock i mean hey like you say that's your passion you can find it or, or it's, you, it's but. just like dude just chuck the safety thing on like you can yeah. still climb it bro but if you fall <laughs> you're gonna be alive yeah. it's not the it's like saying fucking the islanders have more depth okay, cool. <laughs> uh i know what you gotta get cracking soon i don't know if you guys had it had any other final, final well, i, I, I want to ask you yeah. what about your buddy uh you know he, he it was a life goal of his to reach the senior PGA Tour, and he ended up qualifying oh, for an event. Oh, yeah. Uh, guy Doug Clapp, local stick, he um, he qualified for the U.S. Senior Open yesterday, which is awesome. He had to go to a playoff to do it. It was at Thorny Lee in Brockton. You got to be over 50 years old, but to get into the U.S. Senior Open, it's one round. You know, to get into the U.S. Open, it's three rounds pretty much, but one round over 50. You go in and you shoot a number and you play with Freddie Couples and – you know, how all these legendary older golfers, and, and he did it. He went out, I think he shot one under and made par in the playoff hole and moved on, so he's an old sandwich guy, just hits a hard draw every single shot, and he's moving on to Omaha to play in the U.S. Senior Open, so congrats to him. It's pretty cool. Is Greg Norman still playing in the Senior? He doesn't. He doesn't. He uh, Some guys never end up getting into the scene. Like, once they're done on the PGA Tour, they're done. And then some guys obviously love it. They're traveling. They're making good dough. But, no, Norman doesn't play. I don't know if his game isn't there. Because some guys, like Nick Faldo, he just announces, but he stinks at golf now. That's a six-time major champion. So it's weird. You get older, and certain guys can get better in their say, 50s. What do you, when you say stinks, like he... Nah, I mean, I, stinks isn't... Stinks is so relative, but he's not an all-time great golfer into his 50s and 60s like some of these guys are. But if you went toe-to-toe with him, you could potentially beat him? I I have – no. I'm going to – I'm not – no. No. I'm not going to say that. No. No. Because when I say stinks, I'm saying like – I'm saying like he's not a top world golfer in his 50s and 60s. Stinks was a horrible word to use. Yeah. Um, Pod for you. I thought I crushed it. I think you've been pathetic. Paul Medal Championship this weekend. You bet any bet anything at that? No, I've never seen that course. Congaree, I believe it's called. I think they're filling in for another tournament. But I'm more focused on the U.S. Open. Torrey Pines the following week. Father's Day weekend should be a blast. John Rahm was the pick. The guy crushes that course. But now he can't even, because his quarantine has to be in after testing positive for COVID. He can't even show up till Wednesday. So he's played the course a million times, but you don't play it in U.S. Open. When you play it at the Farmers Insurance Tournament, it's different setup. The rough isn't as long. The fairways are wider. So it's going to be a completely different course. But I love watching the U.S. Open. It's a blast. Yeah, it should be good. We'll have some picks next week. Yep. Um, uh, well, yeah, we get some open schedule biz. We're going to have to uh, catch up on some movies and TV shows with uh, with the open nights. I, I also wanted to ask, what's the latest on the, on the on the Brooks and, and uh, Bryson situation? Nothing's really come out besides Brooks gave a press conference leading up to this uh, Congaree tournament. Um, I think it's called Palmetto. He he said he thinks it's great for the game, and so many old golf heads are are, are calling it bullying and and calling it wrong because as much as you like to see a rivalry rivalry between two golfers if it forms through your play it's one thing but when it forms through like social media and Kepka offering beer to fans who got kicked out for making fun of DeChambeau there's people who are in a tizzy about it I don't really care I don't really like DeChambeau I'm not even a Kepka fan either I just think it's interesting now that DeChambeau has come out like we said and said he hates it and every single social media post and every swing he has people are yelling great shot Brooksy so he's in one now and what were you saying about movies? No, I'd say in, uh, now, you know, this Friday night, uh, the, those games scheduled. I don't imagine the Islanders in Tampa going to start then. Just, you know, going to fill your schedule with anything. I, I know I, I mentioned it a few pods ago, Halston, yeah. the, the American designer one. I, I That's an easy one to binge watch. Um, I don't really know if I've l- watched anything since since that. Yeah, I haven't seen, obviously, with the hockey going on. Uh, My I, wife's crushing Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, I haven't started that. It's been recommended she, a bunch. She, she's into it. It's basically like it's current day, but it's a different world where there was kind of like a civil war in the United States. 
I, it's 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 a, it's kind of a crazy show, but a lot of people like it. So maybe check that one out. It's on Hulu. Yeah, just like a dystopian society where basically they'll, they've dialed back the clock for women, more or less. Yeah, well, there's like there's there's only some women who can get pregnant. So then like they have to have babies for like the leaders, and then like the guys' wives who they're married to that can't have kids they hold down the woman as the guy has sex with them it's a Ooh, bizarre you know. it, but it's but it, it's it's a bizarre yeah. show i watched the first episode i wasn't that into it but she's just said it keeps getting better and better so that's one you could check out yeah Handmaid's tale liz moss uh from mad men she's fantastic yeah yeah, yeah she's great in it um I, actually tonight on hbo the last two episodes i talked about before it's called hacks honestly the best new comedy on on tv streaming on hbo max gene smart she stars as like a joan rivers type comedian who's who lives in vegas works in vegas and she hires this young. It's a Zuma, like it, the, the the right is a Zuma, and she's a Boomer, and they have this like generational conflict, which is hilarious because I'm kind of in the middle, so you, I can laugh at both of them. But it's just it's just a well written show, absolutely hysterical, great show. The last two episodes airing tonight, so uh, Hacks on HBO Max definitely gives me gives gets my highest recommendation if you're looking for a new show. It's easy too. It's a half hour episode. I think there's ten of them. You can binge it in a day or you can space it out. Uh and also G just let us know we got some new sweatshirts that dropped in the store as well. Uh the hoodies, right G? Yeah, it was the one Wit was wearing on the podcast the other day. It's the black one and then it has that crazy uh pink and black black and black and gold print and the pink and white print yep. on the inside of the hoodie. So we got a ton of questions about people asking when Wit wore it. So it's on sale now and it's barstoolsports.com slash chicklets. Nice. Boom. And uh I actually uh, one more thing, Bo Burnham. The oh co- yeah. The comedian I really like. He just came out with another project he did. He took he took some time off. I think he uh I think he really struggles with uh, like the mental health stuff. So many comedians it seems have that 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 struggle I feel like like their their job's so difficult in terms of making people laugh and then when you're away from it, maybe people expect you to be funny when in reality you're more quiet. It's it's weird. You see different comedians go through that. I th- I want to say a few years ago he said he was going to be done with it all, but uh, the quarantine he was he was sitting around and he ended up doing it in I think the, I think it's called Inside. Yeah, I started watching it. It was what I saw was it was really good. I haven't finished it yet. I might finish it today. Is it is it a comedy it's, special or is it more like well, a show? It's, no, it's it's not it's a it's a comedy, but I guess it gets a little bit dark and it's it, it was all filmed. He was the only person in the room, so he filled it filmed it oh. and did oh he dude he's a i think he's a creative genius um yans has chirped me before i don't he think he hates him he, yeah I don't, I don't think the comedy sits well with him but he's had a couple netflix specials before where they've been 10 out of 10 i know G- grinelli's a, a big bo burnham guy huge bo burnham guy but fun fact about bo burnham went to the same high school as our guest on this week's podcast colin blackwell no fucking oh, way wow. and the, and and the abs need to put him in tonight on lefty <laughs> <laughs> um on yeah. Another show, I don't know when season two premieres, and we did talk about it back when season one ended, but Dave starring Lil, oh, Lil Dicky. Fucking hilarious. Go watch season one right now. Yep. I think it was on FX. This show, this guy's a rapper. He's hilarious. He's kind of a comedian as well. He writes this show, and it's so good. Season two's coming out pretty soon. And I will say, I think it's one of the all-time best endings to a season, the end of season one. It involves him rapping on a radio show. I'll say that. I'll say no more. Oh, Check his, out Dave. His, Dude, his freestyles. On, oh, sway, like he goes on Sway in the morning So sometimes. he went, yeah, I'm not even going to say. Just yeah. go watch Dave and get ready for season two. I, I bet you it's probably out by July. One of the one of the best shows of the pandemic, oh no doubt God. about it. He's like Dave. the white version of uh, Childish Gambino. He just like multi talented. He can act. He can oh. he probably. I would assume he directs his own show to a certain degree. He probably writes a lot of it. Do you know? Do you know Childish Gambino? Is? Yeah, glove. Uh, what the Danny fuck? Danny Glover. Dan, no, yeah. not Danny Glover. I was thinking. I was. Um, no, I think it is Danny Donald Glover. Glover. Donald Glover. Oh, Danny Donald, Glover's, yeah. Glover's lethal weapon. Oh, I'm too shit, old yeah. for this oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, Atlanta. Isn't he sitting on the toilet yeah. when he's got to, like, yeah, get the a bomb. bomb there? Yeah, uh, Donald Glover, he's very talented. Do you, you watch Atlanta? Uh, he's got- I, I never I never watched Atlanta. I, I was more into his yeah. rap music at the time and, and, and where he was going with his music career. I never got into the other. Was he on 30 Rock? Uh, no, Community. Our he community. was on. Yeah. No, Atlanta's a brilliant show. I think they're actually filming, I think, seasons three and four right now, back yeah. to back. Uh, that's They're both actually, um, Dave and uh, Atlanta, are both on Hulu. You can check them out there. Awesome shows. Also, you have stars. I know 
they uh, I get it for like you get it from like a dollar for like three months on Amazon. There's a show on it called P Valley. Anyone listening? It's a show about a, a black strip joint on like the Mississippi Delta in like this fictional Salt. town. Dude, it's fucking <laughs> it's it's awesome, dude. I, it was another <laughs> no. It, it's, I'm watching it right now. <laughs> <laughs> fucking savage. It's it's a very unique show, dude. It was uh, another show I thought was fantastic during the pandemic. It's just about all the characters and all the various things they got going on. But it's called P Valley. It was based on a play. Uh, and it got, it got turned into a show. So if you have stars or if you're going to get stars, check out P-Valley. So All right. got to well, kill some time. We're in the mix. Like we said, we got three of the four set. Um, a lot of people are thinking that after tonight, it's going to be four for four in terms of the semifinals, getting ready to go. Vegas, Montreal, and Islanders, Tampa. Look out for the coverage we're going to have. And it almost makes me a little sad, boys. We have, at most, 21 hockey games left this year. Let's see how it goes. No, 22. <laughs> 23. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> stack guy wet. All right, this wraps it up from Boston for the season, and then uh, we'll be getting together somewhere soon. We yeah, just we'll don't be in the where. finals. We will be at the finals, wherever it is. Vegas, hopefully. Peace. Right. Have a great weekend. Go Habs.